I did it again because Coletti and Della Volpe both are confronting the idealism, and both of them are anti-Hegelian. And I'm sorry mm -hmm. that I, I hope Arto comes yeah. because he's been reading the science of logic, and this would help him. But, but uh, you know, or help him maybe even both of us, but and all of us. Um, but I, I put this the theory of forms because this is the classic generative model, if you will, something you know I I've been working with many years of how forms are issued, right, in the Platonic universe. And this is classic in terms of the idea of the good being at the top. The idealism is at the top, right? So this is the idea, right, up here. The abs and in Hegelian, is the idea is the approaching of the good, right? Yep. And remember, this is a... Um, 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 hi, um, Cornelius. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Glick sends his regards, okay. by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, the, 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 the reason for this is, again, like I said, uh, the Coletti and Della Volpe, you know, are both confronting a kind of Hegelian idealism, especially Coletti, who is really anti-Hegelian mm -hmm. and anti-materialist, vulgar materialist, which he considers part of the tradition of mm -hmm. Plekhanov, Lenin, all the way up to, you know, the entire Marxist tradition is wrong. Lukács, etc., and the alien stuff. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to look at this today. But I wanted to do this. So this is the classic model of, you know, book six, excuse me, uh, of cognition and knowing and the knowing subject in Plato of how we come to ideas. So think of this as the cave down here. That this is the allegory of the cave, which everybody knows, right? And your movement is from A, B, C, D, E, right? And on these steps, right, more and more levels of abstraction are taking place. More and more levels of abstraction. So read it both vertically, you know, as a vertical ascension, right? It's a two-dimensional thing. And horizontally as four different moments, the source of how our perception and knowing happens, the things that are actually being perceived, the objects, the modes in which they take place, and then the classes, how you classify the, the perception. So anyway, uh, to go back over this again, this is the generation of ideas. You know, for Plato, who is the classic philosophical idealist, right? Not a materialist, and you could say that Epicurus, and to another degree, uh, Democritus and the atomist tradition are, Heraclitus, Possibly, who's again a very, very uh, favorite philosopher of Marx, you know, would be there. But particularly Epicurus is 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 against this, right? Because he's much more about the senses and sense perception in the beginning. So this has a very long history. I'm I'm going to try to you know look at this also. Feuerbach, Feuerbach is the one that starts to invert this against Hegel. And Della Volpe, in particular, very interesting. I mean, I reread and I'm really impressed. I'm going to take this book up to uh, Canada with me and study it over the break. I mean, he has very interesting stuff on the Platonic Hegelian dialectic. This is where I kind of got the idea. I mean, maybe I should show, you know, some of the, the theory of that. So anyway, let me let me go over this for a minute. So basically, the source of perception. And the, the classic distinction that plays out in the history of philosophy, and this is a very well-known book that influenced T.S. Eliot as well as a whole, you know, early 20th century group of poets called Reality and Appearance, Appearance and Reality, by F.H. Bradley, yep, of which I have a first edition. I'm, I'm waiting for the right buyer, because I don't <laughs> read it, and I'm not a fan of it. But it was a Hegelian, Platonic attempt <laughs> to bring, you know, Plato in line with, with uh, Hegel. So anyway, the appearance-reality distinction takes place, and let's start from the bottom up, because this is really where it is. So the level of appearance is governed by the sun. This is a, you know, basically a geocentric model, right? It's not certainly heliotropic, as we get with the Copernican Revolution. And at the bottom, what is being seen in the cave is the images of physical objects through shadows, reflections, and illusions. So the person in the cave is only seeing the projections on the wall, the wall of the cave, right? Okay, so this is one level. The physical, actual physical objects as you start to climb 
a little bit out of this realm of just the projection realm, you actually begin to touch physical objects. So all objects that are perceptible to and by the senses. You know, and this goes on in you know sense data. So if you read across again, you know, to the to the, uh, the horizontal um, level, right? You see in the mode that the imagination and supposition is always working at this level because of the shadow reflections and illusions. Only in that, for Plato, this is, you know, image production, right? And supposition. And then this leads, as you go up, to belief, right? To belief in which you begin to accept your sensory perceptions as a given. I saw that, you know, would be the propositional form or, you know, the the, the, the certainty, all right? So, and then over here, the class of perception, this would be the world of opinion, which is sophisticated. It's not just that you have an opinion or, you know, opinions are for assholes. It's about, you know, your levels of opinion that can be a true and a false opinion as one is trying to make the move to knowledge. And one of the great texts on this low notion of opinion is in Socrates, uh, in Socrates in the Mino of Plato. It's a great dialogue. I'll put it up there. Worth studying because of the slave narrative in that, the very early slave narrative in uh, Western thought and the systems of Western thinking. Okay? So the Mino is a, is a very good, you know, compare the Mino. All right. So you have this line, which is in Plato called the divided line. So you're beginning, you have an inversion or a crossing of that line into the world of, going back over here, reality, which is governed by the idea of the good. <laughs> the idea, I emphasize. Not the materiality, but the idea of the good. Right? The agathon in Greek, right? <laughs> right? The agathon. Agathos means the good person. You know, you know, you know, you know when you say in agathos, you mean they're very good. You know? Yeah. 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 You can be a good man in anthropy, or in uh, agathos, agathos is higher than just being a good man, right, in this. So, so the agathon is very high here, and the, really the, the trajectory here is the idea of the agathon, the idea of the agathon. Okay, so what happens in this world of the things perceived is that mathematical objects are not actual physical things, right? They're abstractions, so you begin to begin to go through the level of hypotheses and hypothetical thinking. Now, of course, this is Plato's discourse with Pythagoras, right, etc., right, and the whole school of Pythagoras, the mathematical of the of the uh, Pythagorean tradition, because Pythagoras and Plato are the first beginning, if you will, of the philosophical dialectic and the tension. The tension between the world one of and the many. yes, yes, exactly the one and the many, as well as uh, as well as uh, yes, the uh, the early uh, paradoxes, as well as the difference between the mathematical and the ethical. You know, because Plato's a very smart man, despite his idealism, because he's thinking through how does one, you know, become ethical in this. One of the reasons, the idea of the good. You know, he understands in the Athenian city-state that you need a notion of the ethical order. Okay, so let me let me go through this. So what happens here is after you cross, and this is a kind of movement like this, right into here, you're kind of throwing it over, right, inverting, if you will, into this line, right. You're going to go through understanding, as in macro mathematical thought, you begin to understand levels of abstraction. Yeah, and the Greeks, of course, have a theory of irrational numbers, yeah, et cetera. Plato has a whole thing about theories of numbers. Uh, it, it's, it's a crazy essay, but if you're interested in this stuff, Victoria, there, there are two great books on this. There's a book on, there's an article in the New School of, for Social Research's um, graduate faculty journal in philosophy by a man named Victorio Husla on Plato's theories of numbers. Um, he's a Hegelian idealist, in my opinion, um, but Plato's theory of numbers. But the great, great book, the great book 
is Jakob Klein, who was at St. John's in Annapolis, the great books program, a German immigrant. Uh, it's called Greek Mathematical Thought. Yeah, really a great book. Truly a great book. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I'm fascinated by it. I don't really have the mathematical background to do it, but of course with Elaine Badiou today, you know, in terms of his, uh, you know, the math thesis, because for Badiou, at the base of everything is, is again, mathematics, right? But just like for Descartes, you know, Badiou will go there, ultimately, and if you read, read his book on the, have you read any of you read the, the communist uh, um, uh, hypothesis? No? Okay. This is his attempt. He, he shows in that he tries to look at the cultural revolution through mathematics and stuff like that. He has a whole thing, a mathematical ontology. He does not, being as mathematics is, is, uh, is by Jews, ontology. And he has four, four things, being an event, the logics of world, and now the eminence of truth. Three volumes is his ontology. It's coming out. Yeah. And the discourse, if you're a follower of Zizek, Zizek is always trying to address by you, both from afar, et cetera. That's, that's really his master, you know, who's, who's, who's operative today. I, mean, I just wanted to get that in. So this here, <coughs> excuse me, is where Badiou's, you know, on, um, ontology begins, right? It's already crossed the line, and this is a materiality for him, right? <laughs> okay? So anyway, going back here again, so understanding, right, as a thing, and this here, I forgot to write it in, is dialectic. This happens in a mode, and dialectic is guided by, you know, Socratic reason, Platonic reason, right? The mimetic, you know, the midwifing that method. So you can see where Socrates we're ignorant in opinion, right? Through a long dialogue, we're going to be able to come to episteme, to knowledge, somewhat, right? But we must go through these stages and undo all the opinions and show the difference between a true opinion, which may put us on the path to knowledge, versus that of a false. All, all this is going on in between this two. So you have dialectic and reason here, Again, and as you see here, the forms are issued in the things perceived that we have forms. We say something's real. We, we begin to talk about justice, which again is an abstraction, right, for Plato. High levels of abstraction, beauty, truth. You can add other categories into this, but this is fundamentally the Platonic dialogues are about, you know, justice, beauty, you know, perception, perception of beauty. The great text on perception is the Theotetus. That's his great, great uh, dialogue, the Theotetus. So anyway, um, the reason I'm doing this is it shows idealism at work, right? <laughs> Down here, <laughs> the idea of the sensuous and all of this, this is false. This is opinion. This is appearance only. It's just shinun or shinun, right, in some ways, and for him, for Plato, in order to get closer to the idea of the good, one must pass through all of these levels and these levels of abstraction about what is justice, etc. Now, of course, Aristotle comes along and says, you know, you know, it's not really up there because this is where Plato's pointing, and most of you probably know the the painting, the School of Athens, where they're coming out of the, the academy and. Socrates, I mean, um, um, excuse me, Plato has his finger up in the air and Aristotle, no, it's down here. So <laughs> we begin to see this kind of materiality in Aristotle play out, right, in a sense, because Aristotle will start to talk about contradiction. <laughs> he will begin to talk about the levels of contradiction, you know, that are, that are operative in terms of this world of ideas. And for him, you know, without beginning with not the idea of the good, but the matter of something, right? So you basically have in Aristotle, the beginning of the discourse of causes, right? So 
When you look at the violin, you're not seeing the violin just as a physical object, right? You're seeing it, first of all, as matter, the wood that made it, right? <laughs> and you're asking the question of what is that matter called wood, right? Then how does it become the form that it does? So the second level, the form itself, is more about the idea, right? But what Plato is missing is a whole substrate of, of matter, materiality, right? The efficient cause is what is it good for? Well, to play music, right? And what is its goal? To give pleasure to the ears, right? Something like that, the teleological. So he begins to think this way, Aristotle thinks this way, and what Aristotle will do with the causes is basically then everybody asks, and this is, you know, one way of looking at what runs the engine. The, the prime mover has to be constructed in order to move all the causes at, at once, right? This is, this is what happens. Who's generating this? And, of course, this begins the discourse, if you will, of origins. You know, where does it start? What is the beginning? What is the it's generative adopted term? Adopted by Thomas of Aquinas. Yes. Where yes. he Who talks about prime movers and... Yes. That's right, but that's Aristotelian terminology because St. Thomas Aquinas' contribution in the Summa Theologica is to synthesize the theory of ideas and somewhat of Aristotle's metaphysics through the prime mover. Right. And this is what he does for the church. Right now, they always got a character ready. They always bring in some agent <laughs> of God, right, to, to do this, this moment. So anyway, I mean... Again, the reason I did, I, I forgot to put it up, Jakob Klein, Klein, Jacob Klein. Yeah, um, it's called the Greek Mathematical Thought. I think it's to, to um, uh, the algebraic, or something like that. He's really worth reading. It's a first-rate mind. He only wrote two books, but both of them are ph phenomenal. The other book is a study of Plato's Mino. It's a kind of long commentary, first-rate commentary of which, you know, we, we were really lo lost today with, with people like Guerrou and, um, and um, you know, used to do in, in France, you know, with these people, so good at this, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. My impression of yeah. the mathematical in Plato yeah. was more about geometry, right? It's those who know geometry can pass through the doors, right? Yes, of course, the most yeah. abstract, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. One plus one is down here equals right. two. It, the, I mean, that synthetic activity that the arithmetic is for democracy, right. whereas geometry is for aristocracy. Right. So really, in a way, you can see this playing out still today, right, in many ways, because what happens is we get this complicated derivative market mm -hmm. since 1973, we're 40-something years into you know, financialization and the dominance of, uh, you know, a fictitious capital and what it's doing, whereas everybody's sitting there just trying to balance the checkbook yeah. in terms of the, quote, democracy, right. using the arithmetic operations instead of, you know, the, quote, calculus and, and things like this. Not that, it, yeah, it works, but I mean, it's interesting because yeah. you begin to see how much of this really operates in everyday life towards the masses and why you know, someone like Gramsci would call Christianity Platonism for the people. And why some people, in some ways, talk about Marx the same way, even though, because it becomes a religion rather than a, you know, you know, an understanding. Marx yeah. was Platonic? No, not at all. No, 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 how, how it becomes t talked about that way oh. as a Platonism for the people. This was a code, though, that Gramsci developed for Christianity, Platonism for the people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, which is very Nietzsche. I don't know. Well, like Neoplatonism is Christian. Well, yeah, right? but, but Neoplatonism, he's not talking about it that way. He's talking about this whole darkness here that is, is, is taking place, that people think they're enlightened because they know how to balance the checkbook or they know how to do right. these kind of operations, but really what's going on is that they're really just, you know, taking the projections of the ruling class or a ruling ideology better put probably that's very dominant in many ways that you know is a trickle down so really what you're getting here is the movement here is really in the system this way right instead of upward right so this is the levels of abstraction and why idealism still operates today yeah 
in a way. And, and our confrontation is to be in this level of material. I think one of the reasons Badiou does talk about mathematical, I mean, you know, even, you know, though, I mean, the amazing advances in mathematics since the 19th century. That's another yeah. thing. I mean, the revolution was really in mathematical thinking. Right? I guess For my most, point was yeah, like yeah, okay. the, the math, uh, right. calling mathematical sort of geometry, it sort of lets you envision forms rather than just a multiplication or the addition. Yes, which is absolutely. Right? Yeah, it's a whole so different then you types can see of why it's more abstract. Well, it's much more abstract yeah. because then you begin to see, well, that's not really justice. Right. You know, the whole discourse in the, uh, in the Republic, if you will, which is formative of what, what is justice, who is it for, for Shimicus, justice is power. Mm -hmm. Justice is, you know, uh, giving to, to each his own, you know, which is uh, the second definition. The first def definition is telling the truth and paying one's debts mm -hmm. by the old man. So you have these, these levels always going on that, yes, you're right. I mean, it becomes this mm -hmm. kind of almost geometrical thing. And the question is never ultimately answered either. Right. You know, it's like the Japanese philosopher uh, Katana, the samurai, who used to go to class barefooted, and they would leave him alone. He's a Japanese Marcus. They know he could kill him. He came out of the whole samurai tradition, and you don't mess with the samurai, no matter if you're fascist or, you know, anyway, because of their <laughs> presence in Japanese culture. Anyway, he says, I've been meditating on uh, one question, what is nothingness, my whole life. I still haven't found the answer. And then he said, that's a good thing. So, yeah, anyway, the, the path of questioning is important here. And for me, this is what Plato gives us, despite the idealism. Yeah. This is something Coletti and Della Volpe don't really talk about that is in, and Chris knows this person, Michal Bakhtin, uh, Cornelius does. You know, this is a very different kind of approach, the dialogical, which is platonic in a way, mm -hmm. although in Bakhtin, I think it's very materially based, and, and uh, you know, you begin to see it in, um, um, you know, and other, other, you know, uh, other thinkers as well. What do you do with this? Are you just going to write treatises, or are you just going to write capital and commentaries on, on capital? You need the dialogical. And for Bakhtin, this was happening in the novel. The novel mm -hmm. is the modern form, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I, I, I think this is, you know, in, in, in some senses very, very, um, 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 you know, relevant in many ways. You can read between the lines here. Uh, you know, of course, with, with Hegel, you know, I, I, maybe in January, I'll figure out a diagram to do the spheres of Plato through the, through, through the, um, the um, phenomenology, right, in a way, because play, uh, Hegel is working similarly in some ways, even though it's a much more complicated spherical attempt you know, because of uh, advances. You know, we're in the heliotropic universe. We're post-Newtonian mm. uh, physics when Hegel's writing in 1807 and, uh, you know, until his death in uh, 1831. So, so anyway, this is going on. Now, what happens, and, uh, you know, to set up somewhat for Coletti, and I'll, I'll talk about the various schools, is that Forbach comes around, the principles for the philosophy of the future, and he's the one who begins to say, wait a minute, <laughs> the senses here and the senses through reason are really where knowledge is happening. So there's a beginning of a different, different uh, you know, uh, uh, category here. So this and this becomes very close in Forbach as the beginning of a new kind of materialism and what's called in Marx's vocabulary of traditional materialism, right, in a sense that the senses themselves are materiality, right? Mm -hmm. And not part of the idealism of the diamond. Yeah? And then we begin to see this play out. To me, Marcusa, for example, Eros and Civilization, those of you that have read it this semester, have read it in the past, is a sensuous rationalist. Mm -hmm. This is where he's really coming. He's not really a Marxist of the Althusser. You know, he's not really a, a, a reader of capital. Mm -hmm. You know, in that sense, he's much more trying to think through philosophical problems than a Forbachian, often hyphen early Marx versus that of you know late Marx mm -hmm. and structural problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, to, to to my mind, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we well, you know, I mean, I, I hope this. I mean, it, it's a good diagram to work with. It's just you know very basic and and but in in between this, you have a lot lot going on. And of course, if you think of films. 
such as Blade Runner, <laughs> V is for Vendetta, you know, these kind of films, you begin to see this kind of operating in, in these films. Metropolis, obviously, by Fritz Lang. You know, you begin to see these kind of pa patterns, you know, the geometry in film, <laughs> you know, playing out in a very, very uh, active way. Yeah, very, very active way. So you begin to see this. And of course, you know, the two dimensional, th this of course is a model for Christianity. This is the two dimensional, you know, this is hell, the good up here, <laughs> right, etc. The idea of God, the idea of this and that. And Coletti's into this very much with uh, the Hegel. I don't know if you read the, the piece, but, you know, on, on the dialectic of matter, he's really showing that Hegel, and I, I agree with him to m many degree, that Hegel is ultimately basically a, a Christian. You know, that this whole phenomenology is basically ultimately the Christian moment, mm -hmm. and that what happens in that <laughs> is that a whole generation, this is Coletti's point, or his ambition, if you will, the whole generation that goes from Georgi Plakhanov, begins with Frederick Engels, Plakhanov, to Lenin, <laughs> or mistaken, Lukács, <laughs> with his Hegelian dialectic. Mm -hmm. This is this is where he's really trying to go, yeah, ultimately. So anyway, um, I'll, I'll leave this for you. I mean, any, any questions or any more thoughts? I mean, I'm trying to, you know, again, just uh, think about the, um, the um, um, you know, some of these moments. I mean, of course, you can fill in the blanks. You know, what is, what is this understanding about? You know, Coletti will use these terms. These are very long, and in German terminology, reason and understanding is what's going on in Kant throughout. Vernuften and Verstanden you know, are the two central categories in the critique of pure reason, right? So you can see again, this here, this mode of perception throughout the entire history of philosophy, you know? And what does Descartes say? Just like Plato, the senses deceive us, mm -hmm. you know? Doubt, doubt, methodological and hyperbolic doubt are trying to show how much the senses deceive us. Marx was the opposite. Marx felt that the senses counted and the superstructures were deceiving. Right, right. Well, that, uh, that's what I'm saying. That you, you invert this to a degree. You're not going to get Marxian materialism, but you're going to begin to see <coughs> the movements, if you will, of the, of, the, of, the, of the tendency, yes. Yeah, towards that. Yeah, yeah. The early Marx is very much about that. The later Marx is, is you know, again... Look, I mean, we can, we can go through this too, yeah, probably more in January after we read a little more in this, but the, 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 the Marxian dialectic, the movement from the concrete to the abstract back to the concrete is a much, you know, is very much indebted somewhat to the levels here of the concrete senses here, right? <laughs> and then moving to the abstraction, but going back to the concrete. What Plato doesn't do dialectically is move back to the concrete. Mm -hmm. So when you think of the abstract, how abstract is a commodity? Mm. You know? To the left, yeah. And how abstract is the circuit that we have, the original circuit of capital, commodity, money, capital? Money existed before, but commodity and the focus upon commodity and commodification, which Lukács just taught us, is, is not there and, you know, and, until Marx. It's over there in the violin yeah. matter <laughs> yes. form, then yeah. you have... I like uh, the example of the violin. Yeah. Exchange yeah. value, <laughs> use value. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, you begin to see this. And, you know, of course, the, the modern trinity, labor, land, capital. You know, you're beginning to see that. Without land, without resource, right, <laughs> there's no real discourse about capital. That's the modern trinitarian formula, as you know, in volume three of capital. Land, labor, you know, and capital. That's that's the modern Trinitarian formula. It's no longer God, God and the Holy Ghost or, and the, the Son, right? Yeah. And the, the, you know, the Augustinian <laughs> Trinitarian thinking. And you begin to see, too, that's another thing, speaking to what Josh spoke about uh, in terms of geometry, you know, you, you begin to see this thinking in triads, 
you know, that's going on. Certainly in Hegel, you know, a whole level of, of the description of the dialectic as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And what Coletti and Della Volpe are really trying to do, look at, is the synthetic a priori. How do we synthesize, you know, in, in some ways? And what, what, what material processes are really going into that? You know, this is where they're really coming from in this post-World you know, post War II Italian schools. Could you explain that synthetic a priori? Whole oh, class. Sorry. Whole class. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, well, the a priori is something that supposedly, I mean, if you think of this like the platonic, you know, something that is already inside us, but we don't know it. <laughs> Right, we have no knowledge of it, Remembering. but somehow it's 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 elicited, elicited, right? Ultimately, this is uh, somewhat about the a priori, hmm. right? I think. Yeah, that, you know, and it's not of the world of experience. Mm -hmm. We're not really experiencing it, but it's related. I don't know if you remember when I did the Gegenstand, the object and objectification. Somehow that's not really being experienced, but that's an a priori domination that's outside the realm of it, whereas the object world, we understand the, the domination. So it's really about objectivity, ultimately. Can we really get to really a full objectivity? Mm. Yeah, mm. the synthetic a priori. Yeah. Okay. So how do we know that one plus one is two? We can count on our fingers, but really the question is, how does that, 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 that quote unquote knowledge of the plus make it possible for us to have this this synthetic activity. Because we're told so, we're taught in school, it's brainwashed into us, or we're, we're going through these repetitious ex exercises, or is there something synthetic, which means coming together, how does that coming together? You know, synthesis really means to come together. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Beatles, you know, they could have titled that song Synthesis. <laughs> right, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 God, God rest John Lennon's soul. Yeah, anyway, anyway, so yeah, <laughs> it just doesn't come. You know, doesn't have the right, uh, the right moment. But 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 anyway, um, the, the 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 thing is, is how does how does this really happen? So philosophers have been perplexed. So there's a formal a priori mm. as you try to investigate through form, mm. and you look at mathematics in this case. There's a material a priori <laughs> as well. You know. Is there something that is grounded here again in the movement of matter? And, and when we talk about materialism, we're not only talking about matter itself dominating, we're talking about levels of movement of matter. Mm -hmm. That's what dialectics is much more about. People forget this, they just think it's about matter, you know? <laughs> and you know, the old equation, energy equals matter of centigrade, you know, square, you know the E equals MC uh, um, squared, right? They're thinking of it that way, or the Big Bang, or something like this. But in, in the tradition, it's really the movement of matter. This is why he, he uses the phrase dialectic of matter. You know, it's always about movement and layers and relations. You know, and this is something we forget too. You know, we get into this kind of black and white Manichaean thinking that we stay away from thinking about gradations, those gray areas, what's happening in between and the interstices of our of our of our thinking. So and this is where the to me, you know, this is where you start to articulate, if you will, the poetry of the future that Marx speaks about. You know, if you're gonna really think about, you know, making a transformative world, you know, you have to think what is the poetry of the future? You know, and what are those poetics? And you think of that material, you know, material. Mm -hmm. yeah, not just to go fishing and hunting and mm -hmm. poetize and philosophize all night, but how does one begin to think of this, you know, in terms of a new imagination? How do you begin to, you know, articulate this? Well, some people think object-oriented philosophy, ontology, is a way of thinking about material and matter. Well, there, there are ontological materialists, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. They're basically saying, like Kant, there are things out there we can't understand. Well, this, this leads us into, and the reason again for the a priori, is this whole notion of the thing in itself, of which Coletti is going to defend. Mm -hmm. You know, Coletti goes to, to defend this. Lucio Coletti, up until the middle 70s, late 70s, is going to defend the thing in itself. There is this new Emil Wren that we do not understand. 
You know, and if you think of this too, this is the phenomenal, right? Right, in some ways in Kantian terminology, the world of appearance, that which we see, that which, which phenomenalizes itself, whereas the, the X is really in reality, the, the new ammo, right? The new Emma, the new Emma world, right? So this is this is a very long thing. What is the thing in itself? So for the Hegelians, Marxists, which Coletti, I mean, I'm not saying I agree with this, but you know, I want you to know that there are fights about this going on, especially with the Italian Marxists against uh, you know the Lukacs, against the Corsias, against the, these um, you know the German, if you will. You know, someone like Adorno is clever. He'll, he'll talk about there's no such thing as a full totality. There's only a partial totality. And I think he's leaving open the door somewhat to the Kantian thing in itself still, you know, if you will. Or that there is the unknown X, right? The unknown X here, right, in a way. Hmm. Now, this is why Freud doesn't, you know, trust philosophers. He'll say it's the unconscious, mm -hmm. right? You know, the concept of the unconscious, which is, of course, the predicate of all of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis doesn't live unless you have an unconscious, right? This was Sartre's big argument with it, you know. You know, how does the superego know what to let in and out? <laughs> That's what he would say. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's an interesting argument, one, one both, both, uh, to, to think about. So anyway, yeah, so the, the thing in itself, you know, and this synthetic a priori that you mentioned is, is it becomes part of a very long, you know, history here in terms of dialectics and what we can know and can't know. Yeah. I'm just going back to yeah. the sure. ego. Could it, could it just be as simple as trial and error? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think the interesting like thing, yeah, like experimental, I mean, you know, these people are coming out of certainly Adela Volpe. I, I know I didn't sign the whole book. and. You know, I mean, that, I mean, I've read this book, you know, one and a half times seriously, and probably are going to read it again, like I said, over the uh, school break. But um, um, Della Volpe is very well aware of what you just said, the experimental model, the experimental scientific model, is what Galileo opens up mm -hmm. against, you know, Aristotle, against the whole, whole tradition, right? So it's interesting. So remember, this this is this presupposes a geocentric universe. Mm -hmm. The Earth is still the center of the world, yeah. right? This is presupposed in Plato's mind. However, this plays out, as Chris mentioned, Neoplatonism, mm -hmm. Christianity, etc., and still plays out all the time. I mean, you know, but I mean, the the level of education is so bad at this point. You have to just wonder, you know, how how long will this go on? You know. And then, then you have it connected to religious, religions, you know, to organized religion, you know, to certain belief systems, from Scientology to, you know, I'm glad J-Lo wasn't seduced, I don't know, I read that this week uh, into the Scientology movement. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, oh yeah. They, no, they approach all the movie stars. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. Pam Anderson, who's now. She's going to be a member of the Situations Collective. I, 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 I see it coming. I'm looking forward <laughs> to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then we'll get good attendance, right? <laughs> <laughs> the things, right? Anyway, so um, yeah, but just to go back to this, I mean, again, I, and I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I really should. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll do this in an email, um, you know, sh tell you where the whole discourse on the thing in itself is in Kant, if you want to read that and kind of, you know, engage in the synthetic a priori and, you know, yeah. But it's a whole course, I mean, the concept of the a priori. I'm, I'm sorry to say, I mean, you know, you could have a, a seminar on this, this, this kind of stuff. It's very difficult, yeah. And still nobody's really, you know, totally satisfied, mm -hmm. you know, the... The, the final word on this, you know, because you have to think of it a posteriori and a priori too. You have to think it again dialectically, you know, and how are you making judgments? Is mm -hmm. it an analytical judgment? Is it a synthetic judgment? What's going on in, you know, one's mind? So even though Kant's very turgid, he's very important for our world, etc. 
And I mean, the reason I bring them up once again is the Coletti and Della Volpe are part of the anti Crocian school, Benedetto Croce, the Hegelian, who was the teacher of Gramsci, and Gramsci's, you know, kind of foil for a long time. And they're coming out of a different tradition other than the Hegelian, you know, Marxist tradition like a Gramsci. So after World War II, let me, let me just do this really quickly. So the two major figures, Lucio Coletti is a student of Galvano della Volpe. Della Volpe is out of Bologna, which is a communist, you know, university, has been known for many times. Most of you know, of course, Post-World War II, Italy was on the verge of going communist. The, pe the Pici was very, very uh, solid. And um, um, so Coletti and, uh, you know, studies with Della Volpe. Another great person that's not really read in the United States, another student is, is Luparini, who put together a great conference, uh, Cesare Luparini, who put together a conference on um, subjectivity of which Sartre was the main participant in 1961 and uh, very interesting about the return of subjectivity against you know again against dogmatic Marxism if you will mm. right so Luparini was a good student Mario Tronti of the workerism group very important now a lot of his work is beginning to be translated um, um, uh, so Tronti will be, I think, read more actively uh, in the next 10 years because a lot of it's starting to come out, mm -hmm. you know, and was, you know, an early Negre-like figure. Negre kind of is an interesting diversion from all of this uh, uh, in the sense that, and we're going to end with Negre, time for revolution, but Negre becomes a kind of diversion, uh, or I mean derivative, of a Tronti you know, and an anti Gramsci in some ways. I Mario Tronti, T R O N T I. Mario Tronti. Yeah. Very little is translated. The guy that I really like, and I've read a little bit of him in French, I mean, you know, he's a very ambitious. He attempted to synthesize Lukács and <laughs> as uh, uh, Constanzo, um, <laughs> Constanzo uh, Previ, right? And not known at all in the United States. So there's a whole group of people, Valentino Giorgetti, not known at all in the United States. So there's a whole group of people, Valentino Jaratha, et cetera, not known in the United States at all. But they kind of come out of this post-World War II moment of which the two major representatives that we have in English are Galvano della Volpe and Lucio Coletti, both of whom were made possible by the New Left Review crowd, by Perry Anderson and the connections Quentin Hoare, Perry Anderson had to you know, European Marxism, Western are, Marxism. Yeah. Are you saying Tronti and Negre are anti Gramsci? Gramsci, yes. Yeah. It was a reaction towards Gramsci and the party. So let me let me do this too. So there's post World War Two. There's Togliatti, who's the head of the party. Palmero, Palmero, Togliatti is the head of the P, P, the, the uh, PCI, right? And he is a Gramscian, right? Definitely. The party itself is Gramscian in formation. One of the reasons Apostolini writes a poem about why he leaves the party, but he loves Gramsci. Mm -hmm. Because Gramsci is at the base of the party, but he feels they've distorted some of his thinking. So, Pugliati, the fight is against the party's representation of Gramsci, as well as Gramsci himself and the Hegelianism. It becomes a school centered around Della Volpe, which begins this moment of, you know, we're more Kantian Marxists than Hegelian Marxists. So where's Della Volpe on the Gramsci issue? Well, he's, he, he's a member of the party. However, he's not really a Hegelian member of the party. And he's the troublemaker in the party. Okay. He's the big time troublemaker. He actually polemics. He and Coletti got into big polemics with the party over the years. They had a journal, I forgot the name of it, but I think it was called Societe, something like that, or Societas, something which they, they confronted the party multiple times, both internally and externally. Yeah. But mostly internally. Della Volpe remained a member of the party the whole time. Coletti split. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Tronti and them went the other way. You know, they, they basically, you know, were much more militant, you know, in a way. They're, in, in some ways, very imaginative. This Italian history is pretty interesting because, on, you know, the, we've always been, you know, kind of indoctrinated, if you will, because the French have such a presence in the United States and in the UK. The Italians are pretty amazing, the levels of the fight and the contributions. I mean, I, I, I'm not kidding. I, I really, I've looked at some of his work. I don't think any of it's been translated in English. If it is, please look at it, Preve. I mean, this is really major thinking, right, that, that went on. There's also a guy named Tomba, who Haymarket has published now a version of on time and Marx, time and work. Very interesting uh, thing. He also comes out of these schools. So I'm going to divide this into three things, right? So you have a Labriola de Gramsci, back to what uh, Chris Knight just uh, mentioned. They have one phase of Italian Marxism is from Antonio Labriola, who was a friend of Engels, right? And wrote a materialist conception of history, right? And, uh, you know, it was a major player. He said the revolution, everybody will live like Spinoza. I guess that means a very ethical man after the revolution was the figure he used. But Labriola was very influential in Italian Marxism, etc. Right? Of whom Gramsci read early on and tried to work with Croce. Croce, of course, is in the background. And then there's Gentili, Giovanni Gentili, who also was a Hegelian. And, you know, I know you put up the Galileo, that's the chapter before, but it's really the Della Volpe is oh. the Crocean Gentilian Was it the wrong one? moments, not Galileo. Yeah, he, he writes on Galileo's method earlier uh, uh, in the thing. But yes, and here it's it's a Gentilian Italian Hegelianism, right? Mm. Yeah, from Gentili, from uh, yeah, Croce to Gentili. Yeah. So Giovanni Gentili was the fascist philosopher. He was Mussolini's, mm -hmm. you know, basically mm -hmm. the, 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 what would Alfred Rosenberg and Baumler were to Hitler, you know, uh, Gentili was to Mussolini. So you have that moment from Labriola to Gramsci, the prison notebooks, and as most of, you know, we've talked about here, the prison notebooks are not really put out until the 50s, and, you know, they're not really in the United States, not really a reception until the 70s, and most of our you know, experience in graduate programs in the United States or in, on the left with Gramsci has been through the prison notebooks. And, you know, this has been our exposure really to Italian Marxism, at least in the beginning, before people like Negre became more household because of the Empire book, which was 2000, published by Harvard. That became another, no, another level here. And of course, Silvia Federici, you know, who who is Italian and works and did, you know, very good work on women's reproduction, uh, Caliban and the Witch, very interesting stuff on, you know, rereading of Marx and the Marxist tradition, the exclusion of women and, and reproduction mm -hmm. in, the, in, 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 the, in the work and schemes of reproduction. So anyway, um, so that's one. That, then theory after fascism is post-World War II. I'm trying to divide this into periods for you, maybe fit it better. So theory after fascism, and this is where Della Volpe and Lucio Coletti, among others, Lucio Magri, Tronti is operating, you know, earlier in this time, you know, and then Togliatti in the party. So you have this after fascism, mostly again, it was the debate on the dialectic of matter, materialism, remember, 1956 is the desalinization period. So a lot of people are confronting Diamat. What was the dialect? How did the dialectic make someone like Stalin possible? Remember, this is in the air, you know, to contextualize it, right? In so many ways, in 56. And then after this theory, after that, in the 60s and up until today, you have reconstructive projects going on, such as Preve, you know, bringing Lukács and Althusser together. Um, you know, you have Tomba, who's going to look at time and labor. You know, many other people, too. And there's Luperini, you know, who's part of that generation, but still worked more later. And then the critical assessments. And I don't think Italian Marxism is dead. I think it's, you know, kind of going through, you know, what most of Marxism going, fending for these kind of, what I would call, reconstructive projects which require a lot of historization, but at the same time, 
you know, future oriented, you know, and how do you work through, again, what Rory uh, sent me in an email, how do you work through this practical theoretical divide, the theory practice divide that's so operative here, that we're going to get a watered down social democrat with all due respect again to the fight, I mean, you know, uh, in some ways, um, we're going to really just hear about, you know, health care, single payer health care. We're going to hear about more jobs. We're going to hear the same old stuff, pre-new, you know, the new New Deal, you know, is it going to be the Bernie Sanders call, etc. To me, it's very tedious and repetitious. It's like listening to Dixieland versus Hardbop. But anyway, uh, you know, in terms of uh, my ears. But, uh, but, but. I think this is important to remember that we're reliving, right, in a way, a very watered down version of the debate of the 1920s between social democracy mm -hmm. and the Luxembourgist, uh, you know, Leninist factions, you know, in many ways. We're, we're really living through this very watered down because I don't think most of these people even know what social democracy was during this period. And, you know, um, yeah. very, very, very strange to me. So I'm not saying that we should be, you know, so, don't hear me this way that we I, we should be arrogant or completely dismissive. I mean, any little gain would help. I mean, I'd, I'd be, re, re, you know, jubilant if everybody had health care or at least the right. You know, people started to think of it as a right without having to pay an arm and a leg. I know people paying twelve thousand dollars a year for individual policies that with big deductibles. This is insanity. You know, insanity. This is a basic right. When you really think about the, the two major rights you, you should really be fighting, education and medicine, are bankrupting people. Mm -hmm. Two basic rights. This is the new class of indentured servitude. Yeah. That are coming through two basic rights that everybody has in all the other advanced countries. Yeah. You can go to McGill University in Canada for one quarter the cost of coming to this, you know, uh, you know, Podunk U University called LIU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, in all honesty. Yeah, with a high powered faculty, grounds, you know, etc. Yeah, if you can get in, of course. Yeah, but I mean, still, you know, in terms of cost, right? In some ways, right? And, and what, what's this about? You know, I mean, yeah, ultimately, it's to keep people, my opinion. Give them images, success, <laughs> right? You're going to be success. You can be an entrepreneur too. You can work in huts and yards as long as you, you know, show up every day, right? <laughs> right, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, you know, and of course, propaganda is always working down here. It's another thing that we don't really talk about so much anymore because I don't think the state, you know, going to Althusser, which we'll do in January, when you think about the ideological state apparatuses, the system no longer needs the ideological state apparatuses, the family, the church, and the educational system. They've already destroyed all of those notions completely, right? And as ideology. They only need the repressive state apparatuses, the courts, the law, and the police. You know, when you really think it, we have no need, the, the ideological apparatus and the propaganda, yeah, no longer out there. I, I, you know, personally, I mean, this is the way I think, yeah. I mean, we have enough weapons, deconstruction, you know, hermeneutical interpret, you know, interpretation and stuff like that to dismantle the whole thing through criti criticism of weapons and through the weapons of criticism, but we don't, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't get anywhere. So you have to ask the question, <laughs> you know, how much can you demystify, et cetera, but still the repressive state apparatus is running everything. And Trump is a very good example of this. It's a kind of new militarization. The militarization, to my mind, started on the end tail of Jimmy Carter. It's a remilitarization started in the late 70s, and of course Reagan accelerated, and it's been there, you know, I mean, we're going to praise, you know, George Bush, warmonger, <laughs> war criminal, you know, Carlisle Group, you know, friends to, you know, every Saudi, uh, you know, uh, sleazeball that's uh, out there. But, but anyway, we, we, you know, think about this. Yeah, in some ways, do you really need this, this ideological uh, uh, state apparatuses at work anymore? I mean, of course they work on the kids. Yeah, I mean, my kid, you know, all they want is jobs. Yeah, please. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. just thinking yeah. of, uh, again, I, I was watching some, some things about what's going on in Wisconsin, 
um, which is a, a classic example of just dispensing with all ideology <laughs> of you know the cultural family and democracy particularly is simply naked you know the the outgoing I don't know if you're so familiar good. with it the outgoing Republicans they were swept out of office in every elective office by the Democrats mm -hmm. so in the lame duck session they're passing every every measure they can right. to deprive the governor and the legislature of I can power. turn on the heat I can oh okay yeah yeah. yeah yeah I turned it off because it was like a Free. sauna yeah no no okay. please yeah. I mean I, I turned it off earlier yeah. so. anyway so they, 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 they're passing all these measures that will deprive you know the leg legislature the, 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 you know right they, they do control the judiciary right for the time being right which is elected so that but you know in this last month of lame duck session they're almost neutering yeah. the executive branches of government that were swept into cleaning yeah. up the state yeah and, and the and shocking thing is the transparency yeah. the transparency there's no yeah. you know, in, the, in the united states to me to my mind since we're kind of trying to do theory here and trying to you know keep some kind of movement in the theoretical realm um is that you know marxists have totally neglected the legal sphere you know you have one or two people that have really gone in there like tiger michael tiger law and and and, and, and uh, the evolution of capitalism mitchell franklin there are a few people but very little on this you know there was a book duncan kennedy and wendy brown on left legalism you know um um over the uh you know, several years ago, critical legal studies, but there's really a completely untheorized domain, right? And the other one is aesthetics. Well, yeah. with the legal, I mean, the yeah. right is not neglected at all. The no, of course not. No, I mean, that's my point. Yeah, is, yeah. I mean, it's choosing it's these judges and, and training yeah. them. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's no comparable left yeah. Uh, anything. Yeah, and we have well, a very the, yeah, please. But the left wouldn't. I mean, this is an unjustified system altogether. Why would the Marxists take up a legal system against the, you know? Well, it's not to state. take it up; it's to yeah. understand. I mean, or to understand. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yes, and also, yes. I mean, you know, in some ways, the courts were used. I mean, Huey Newton's reputation was built sure. on a knowledge of I his, okay. his, uh, like you know, the way. civil codes in, in, in Berkeley, right? I mean, you know, or in uh, yeah. the Bay Area, in Oakland, I'm sorry, not in Berkeley. I guess it just seems yeah. like the Marxists, they concentrate on overthrowing the state, right? Like revolution, rather than well, engagement. Well, uh, right? so not the academic Marxists, <laughs> but some, some other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Long run, maybe. Right, 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 right. With small arms training, you know, that's, that's what we need. Uh, yeah. Yeah, these days, yeah, yeah. But I'm just talking about theory where yeah. it's very under-theorized how the relationship between base and superstructure and that ideology of the jurisprudence really is working and how does that work out. And, you know, and very few people wrote, how was Reaganism, Thatcherism really possible? Very few people have gone, taken a step back and said, Let's take a look at the change in accounting practices, and let's take account. Let's take it into consideration the, the way the laws changed that turned this into no longer the welfare state or semblance of a real welfare state because it's down there, right? Into the corporate welfare state. How did we get to this point where Congress almost automatically will give a tax bonanza to the big corporations, right? When this wasn't possible 40 years ago. And how do these laws change? What do they do? How do they affect everything from layoffs to, you know, the bottom line? How did inflation contribute? There's been no real studies about this in a, in a comprehensive way. I mean, the people that hint at it, but never really develop. You know, yeah. So I mean, the question is moving forward: Is there going to be more than the typical social de de democratic cry? We want, you know, more jobs. We don't want jobs. <laughs> we don't want to work. We don't know what we want jobs for, you know? I mean, at that this point, this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, you know, and we want, you know, single-payer health care, right? We want health care for all, right? Nobody talks about shorter weeks, <laughs> guaranteed income, which is very possible. All the means are there. That's, that, that again, is the issue. The means are really there for these kind of things. 
you know, you should have a, a formula. This is sort of should be mapped out as a formula for guaranteed income that certain people, two single people or two, a couple living in New York City that's under 35 years of, of age needs X amount of dollars to, to, to live here, right? You know, in certain neighborhoods, you could do it by, you know, yeah, you could begin at that level. Yeah, the married couple, the family of four, what is required here in terms of getting in. And that doesn't take away from the right, you know, the so-called right to work, <laughs> right? Yeah, if you want more, go go to work, yeah. But, you know, yeah. But if you know how to cook and you know how to shop, you know, you may be very open to having a guaranteed income than going to the office uh, 40 hours a week or something like that. Yeah. yeah. What? Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying that, that, you know, there's a misplace. There's never really much, to, you know, and everything becomes single issues, too, again, instead of saying this is really about the overthrow, as, you know, as Chris was saying and, and Josh was saying, the overthrow of capitalism. You know, this is not on the agenda. You don't hear Ocasio speaking this way, do you? You don't hear Bernie Sanders saying that capitalism needs to be overthrown, yeah. that this is the system. No, you're never going to, you're not going to hear this. Yeah. Yeah. Ocasio a little more, maybe. I mean, you know, she's just, just starting out. But um, one of the things that seems interesting and that's getting some attention is the left and the right, not only the U.S., but in, in Europe in particular, seem to be coming around and meeting meeting up in terms of the overthrow of the state, mm. uh, which is not the first time they... What, 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 what are you referring to? The, the, the yellow, yellow vest? vest? No, 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 not the... I mean, these... Uh, um, there was a piece in the New York Review of Books that just came out about um, the, the French New Right um, led in the big... Well, we need to talk about those guys because they're very popular and they're smart. Benoit, you know, these people are very, very smart. Mm -hmm. And they're Nietzschean and, and Heideggerian to a degree. Yeah. To a degree. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Not, it's not just guys. It's, uh, 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 well, she's the representative. But behind this are thinkers. Le Pen, Le yeah. Pen's yeah. Uh, yeah. granddaughter, but this, uh, who's, uh, <laughs> you know, has a big following out. She's... Um, left off the name of the pen from her name, so she's yeah. just Marischal. This is someone that should be read critically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very important. Telos published a lot of his stuff back in the day. Yeah. yeah. And Bannon is trying to do an international yes. of, of all the right-wing parties in Europe. And, uh, yes, absolutely. You know, and you got Vera Feikis on the other on side the other with, side, with uh, not, the little, yeah, yeah. Not, not much of a competition yeah. with Bannon, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know. Um, so anyway, yeah. These are these are dangerous, uh, dangerous people. They they can think. <laughs> you know, it's not like your average. You know, Jerry <laughs> Falwell or Pat Robinson here at work. <laughs> you know, these are people that have studied philosophy. They're very manipulative. They understand. You know, they also believe that the masses have no capacity. They they, they presuppose a kind of arrogance and a contempt, if you will. And this, re this is a return. On the other side of this, as most of you know, there are figures like Ortega y Gasset in Spain and other, the revolt of the masses. There's Giulio Savola in Italy, who's very prominent on the right with, with Gentili, who, who didn't stay with Mussolini the whole time. He was smart, but he went the way of the occult. They had a lot of philosophers like this of which still played out in the 60s. These kind of figures were cult here. And when you go back and read Junger, read Total, Total Mobilization, you can see right there the movie of this world. You know, this is the Christopher Nolan film before your eyes, right? <laughs> in some ways, I, I think, yeah, yeah. So very, very important to keep this in mind that these people are, are, are they mean business. I mean, you know, and, and, and the left, is good at, you know, calling out stuff and has all this critique and it's good critique. But, you know, in terms of understanding how powerful the other side is and what you're going to do about it, I think it's very limited. Very limited. And when people start saying that, oh, the contradictions and the revolution's going to happen and it's imminent and all this kind of stuff, this is, you know, yeah. Yeah. Very, very difficult to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very possible that Trump, even despite, you know, this decline in the stock market the last uh, 
month and a half or so will be reelected in 2020 okay. unless the Democrats come up with the right person. You know, and I think the right person is Sherrod Brown, but I don't think I don't know if they're going to go that way. Yeah. You know? And I think Sanders is going to, you know, throw his hat into the ring. And I'm not so sure people are going to vote for Sanders four years past the grandfather age and mm -hmm. how he's going to come across. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what kind of... He's yeah. not that much older than Trump That's true. and Biden. That's true. But Trump has the palace already. He has what? He has the palace already. You know? He's working from the palace. That gives him an advantage. Right. from the White House, right? We need, we need a Rasputin for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe for Melania. It didn't yeah. work too, too well yeah, for him. We worked through that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Barron looks like he's already under the spell of Rasputin, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the kid, huh? <laughs> yeah. What a name, though. Well, of course. I mean, it gives you the indication how you name your kids, right? Yeah, like I called his dog Justine after this odd so Justine <laughs> lost the virtues. So it's something in naming the dog and the children in some way. Okay, so let, let me just go back to that. So three periods, etc. cetera. Uh, De La Volpe, as I, I mentioned on Wednesday night and maybe I've mentioned here, you know, has three real realms of expertise. And you can see, I mean, as a logician, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, as a... Logic in the tradition, the three great logicians, in my opinion, are Lefebvre's Dialectical Logic, which was written as a um, compendium for the party in 1940 in France. Ilyenyov, Dialectical Logic in, in, um, in Russia, 19, uh, he wrote that uh, in the 60s. And then, of course, Delavope's Logic is Historical Science. By the way, this book here that I have, um, yeah, uh, the Della Volpe that I that have, the new left. This, this book was came out in three editions. He wanted to retitle it, Logic as a Historical Science, not as a Positive Science. So just to keep that in mind, the context of the dialectical history of logic, again, historically. So as a logician, as an aesthetician, and as a political philosopher. And not that the three are that separate in some ways, or especially, you know, these two, uh, and these two, I mean, are very closely related. But, but anyway, so we're reading, I just wanted us to get a sense of this Italian Hegelianism that he's gonna work through. Again, I recommend his book, Critique of Taste, um, it, it has a very good section on poetry. I have an argument with it, but it's 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 very good. I'll let it's you know when it gets here. Oh, it you're going to get it. Okay, January. Go. Okay. It's coming from England. Okay, yeah. Well, it goes to show you how popular he is. <laughs> <laughs> what little good cabal we have here of reading unknown books. Yeah. Right. Anyway, the other the other great book of his is from Rousseau to Marx. So I'm political. So yeah, the Rousseau to Marx critique of taste. And that's a reading, fundamentally, of Kant's third critique and a little bit of Hegel's aesthetics. Political philosophy from Rousseau. And, and the good thing about both him and his student, Coletti, is that they brought Rousseau back into the fore for thinking politically that very few people of the German, Althusser, I mean, excuse me, not Althusser, Althusser engaged Rousseau. Um, um, the Frankfurt School and Lukács and the German schools really did not really read Rousseau and Marx together and, and do any commentary. So they did a big service by going back to Rousseau, I, I think. You know, very, very smart. From Rousseau to Marx, and, and Coletti's book, by the way, was from Rousseau to Lenin. <laughs> so, you know, Coletti does a, a longer longer trajectory, right? Includes Lenin. Okay? And then, of course, the logic as historical or as positive science. Like I said, he remained a, um, 
remained a, a party member until his death. He dies 1968, mm -hmm. and maybe we can, you know, look at the look at the text a little bit now that we have some situatedness to him. Um, we're reading from the appendix. Let me let me just give you an idea of the scope of this book. I mean, it's 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 a hard read if you don't have a background in you know in logic and especially in formal and dialectical logic. He begins with a critique if you will, of Kantian logic in, the, in this book, which is very good. Kant himself wrote a logic. You know, when you were a philosopher in Germany of the rank of a Kant and a Hegel, you had to write a logic in order to become, a, you know, quote unquote, the, the, the master thinker, right? So, you know, he did, he takes that on. Then he goes on the Platonic Hegelian dialectic, which I was trying to look at a little bit earlier with the theory of forms and the Aristotle's analytics. And as I mentioned to you, Marx dies with um, a copy of Aristotle's prior analytics in his hands in ancient Greek. It's on, on the reading chair. He dies in his reading chair with uh, reading Aristotle's prior analytics in ancient Greek. So anyway, okay, and then he goes from the ancient critique of Platonism to that of the modern critique of pure reason back to Kant. And then he does a very good analysis. And I, if you read one chapter of this extra, it would be the scientific dialectic, the last one, which is entitled um, from the hetero, um, uh, um, the, the scientific discourse. I think it's, it's, it's a shortened version, but it's really called from the um, tauto, tautology, sameness, to heterological identity and the scientific dialectic. And if you read this alongside of Heidegger's Identity and Difference, and maybe some chapters of Deleuze's Difference and Repetition, you're going to really have a good sense of the ontological and difference in identity and dialectical thinking. Mm. Okay? So just as a hint, I mean, it's a really good way to approach this without driving yourself mad through textbooks, etc. So, yeah, so very, very, very good in this sense. And this is really a justification of Galileo and Galilean, you know, experimental method where, you know, mm -hmm. uh, David started with the trial. empirical moment of trial and error. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Galileo was a little more than just trial <laughs> and error, but, you know, anyway. But, but he, did, he did say, by the way, uh, Galileo, and uh, I think already begins one chapter. Yeah, this is a great quote from uh, Galileo. This little fellow, the Jesuit Schneider, goes about thinking up one by one things that would be required to serve his purposes yeah. instead of adjusting his purposes step by step to the things that are yeah. as they are. Heidegger okay? makes it's that a point. great, great quote from yeah. uh, from Dalai. He likes yeah. that too. Heidegger talks about that. Yes, exactly. In that, in that book. Too. So, you know, sometimes the uh, conservative revolution and yeah. the uh, radical <laughs> revolution or, uh, or, uh, or the, uh, the other kind of revolution, leftist <laughs> revolution, can be on the same page in yeah. terms of the movement. Yeah. Right? Okay? So, and then, I mean, he also quote another epigraph to this is Hegel does not develop his thought from the object. But instead, this is interesting, again, going back to the diagram of the Platonic um, theory of forms, instead the object is constructed according to a system of thought, right? Yeah. Of thoughts in the head, perfected in the abstract sphere of logic. So these are the two confrontations he really wants to do, you know, in a way, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, throughout this this text, yeah, you wanted to say something. Yeah. No, it's this is a, a hard text. I found this to be difficult. You mean the uh, the Croce and yeah. the Yeah. Well, this is written. I mean, the reason it's here and the reason I wanted to do it, mm -hmm. it's aimed at the party and the tradition, mm -hmm. right? This is what it's about. So, so anyway, maybe we can go over this and then try to get to the Coletti. I wanted to mention to everybody, the people that came in a little later. I would like to do two more sessions uh, in January. I'm thinking January 19th here, as well as the 26th. So I'll send out an email. What we would do is we do um, Sartre, you know, uh, and Lefebvre. We'll do Sartre and Lefebvre somewhat today. I hope, you know, I don't want to, you know, get bogged down too much, you know, in the Italians. But we can go back. I mean, we we'll have time, and. Um, um, uh, I would like to do the um, Althusser 
anti-humanist uh, piece, the historical task of philosophy. I think we'll learn a lot from that, reading that. I think it's very accessible in some ways. What book? About it's in, um, uh, well, it's on our website, right, Josh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you just get it on the website. I think it's in The Humanist Controversy by yeah, Althusser. Yeah, there's like a like picture that. of him like on oh, the yeah. cover. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of like... <laughs> I won't be here. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So the next time is uh, January nineteenth, and then we'll we'll go full circle from Gramsci to Negri. We'll do Time for Revolution, the last section of that book, which I think is very interesting for our purposes. Going back to what Chris mentioned today, going back to the Parmenidean and the uh, Pythagorean moment of the one and the many, right? Because the multitude is really problematized in that text by Negre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So we will go back there. But let, let's take a look at this. Okay, so to clarify, uh, 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 yeah, again, um, Italian Hegelianism, the readers of Croce's logic as science is, as pure concrete is struck from the very chapter by the disproportion between the author's intention and achievements. It's not difficult to assess the assess the validity of Croce's claim to have critically re-examined the problem, and this is why I say the seminar, of the a priori synthesis, right, to have gone beyond Hegel's synthesis of opposites, right? So what Hegel really tries to do is bring the a priori and the a posteriori into something that he's synthesizing both of the contraries. He pulls off an Aristotelian move mm. against against uh, Kant, right? Okay. At the very beginning of the first chapter, we are told, if man was not picturing something, he would not be thinking. So this has been in a debate in the pictorial sense of representation. And according to Descartes, you know, there's no distinction between dreams and actual life if you're dealing with the pictorial representation mm -hmm. of reality. You know? Because you have pictures in your dreams, it's the same stuff, you know, etc. Yeah? And, you know, the pic picture yeah. thinking, this is called. I right? wrote it down in First Philosophy. Good. Some thoughts are like images of things, and it is these, al these alone that uh, the name idea properly belongs. Right. Yeah, good. Pictures and things. Yeah. This is from Descartes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So, but the same chapter, the affirmation of the concept that the concept arises from representations is something implicit in them which must be made explicit. So this is Leibniz. And again, I think this institute, you know, if we really can get this left academy going off the ground, we should have, you know, kind of like a, a very good course that, you know, attunes people to the central ideas of each of the, quote, master thinkers, you know, in each period. You know, we could do, you know, a three-week intensive on the French rationalists and what they spawned, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, if, if you will. Then we do, you know, Kant, Hegel, you know, Feuerbach, or some of those Schelling and Feuerbach, and, you know, do stuff like that. You know, basic concepts and methods, Plato and Aristotle, you know, because I think that's going to make these texts, you know, really much more fruitful, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so Croce's entire philosophy is but a, and this is interesting because here they go, they're going to take on Croce in one or two paragraphs, is but a systematic ex exhibition of the contrast between critical intentions and dogmatic results. <laughs> right? In the sentence quoted, he, however, dissatisfied with Hegel, he maybe falls back into Hegel's pre critical conception of sensation as implicit, indistinct, and confused thought. We are told that the birth of the concept transfigures the representation out of which it arises and renders them other than what they really were, determinate instead of indeterminate, logical instead of fantastic, clear and distinct instead of clear and indistinct. Despite Croce's own theory of the autonomy of intuition, the aesthetic wherein lies Croce himself maintains the Kant's advance over Leibniz, the refutation of the theory of beautiful as confused concept and the recognition of the new excuse me, the need for a quantita qualitative distinction between the two spiritual forms. So anyway, what he's really trying to do here is take on, you know, the fact that Croce, right, 
is ultimately, in his defense of Hegel, right, is mistaken about what intuition is, what intellectual intuition is, and how a concept is formed, right? And then he goes back into pre-critical dogmatic results. Mm-hmm. Pre-critical mean, when you say pre-critical in philosophy, it's pre kant Pre-critical thinking, yes. Kant is the event. By the way, for a good approach to Kant's uh, philosophy, it's it's very original. Is Deleuze is Kant's critical thinking, mm-hmm. little little small book. He doesn't like Kant, you know, uh, but you know he talks about him. He begins with a Shakespearean quote: "Time is out of joint," and he works works with that through. It's a very good study of Kant. Yeah, and the best I mean the best exposition is this guy. He's really good. Um, Henry Allison was at Yale. Very, very good book, a very sharp commentary. Unfortunately, the French commentaries, which are exceptional, including uh, Alexis Filonenko, who's a Russian emigre, are not translated. But really beautiful stuff. But this is the best in English uh, on Kant, if you're interested in following along, if you ever read the critique. You know, just as a hint, I know we only have so much time in the day, but uh, it's a very, very good. <laughs> you know. uh, also, Lucien Goldman. You know, who wrote the book on Lukács and Heidegger, and other books, too. The Ducaché. The Hidden God, yes. Yeah, beautiful study of, um, of um, Rabelais and uh, Racine and Pascal. Um, um, also wrote a very good book on Kant, very accessible book on Kant. Right? And uh, Bernard Edelman, <laughs> an Althusserian judge, actually, very in French system, uh, actually wrote a book called The House That Kant Built, which is available in English, but it'll probably be $200 you know, <laughs> at eBay uh, Books or Amazon or whatever. It's very hard to get. But I think it's in some libraries. Mm-hmm. Very nice approach to Kant and the architectonic, the mm-hmm. construction of the critique of pure reason. Okay, let, let's go back to this. I'll, I'll try to do, I mean, I wanted us to see, Ital- you know, the confrontation, like I said, Italian Hegelianism, Italian Marxist thought begins with Italian Spinozaism and Labriola. It morphs because of Croce's influence of being the only one to really read Hegel seriously in the academy and becoming kind of the master thinker of the Italian school. Italian Hegelianism plays out. So a person like Gramsci comes up with this backdrop. Mm-hmm. Right? So this is why Coletti's doing this, Italian Hegelianism, you know, in this period, from Croce to Gentile. They want to get, get rid of it. They want to remove themselves by working it through, and working it through on the level of Croce's thinking about Hegel, which happens to be dogmatic results about intuition mm-hmm. and concept formation. And that ultimately, it's not dialectical at all. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is this is where he's really going going to. Okay, what page. Uh, uh, well, I was on page one, really, still, but, but you know, page <laughs> two now, uh, two thirty, yeah. the next second page. So we see that the logic is the uh, is the basis for his aesthetics of the entire the philosophy of spirit as a system of distinctions. Indeed, does not e- adopt Hegel's dictum that in every judgment all real, re, reality is predicated of the subject and only the totality of predicates, the full concept of the real, the spirit, or the idea is sufficient. So he wants to look at this, you know, vis-a-vis, you know, how Croce himself is not so Hegelian either, mm-hmm. you know, or, or that true to, to Hegel, mm-hmm. right? So he begins with the good intentions, etc. right? He goes on. Okay. Let me, let me go to the critique, which is on page 231. It is naively dogmatic, three objections to his line of argumentation. It's naively dogmatic to attempt to reconcile the truth of reason with the truth of fact. 
simply by noting the thought that defines the fact arises from varying psychological conditions. In philosophy, this is called psychologism. Okay. The threat of the small principle here is constant. We have, for example, a problem that is individual and diverse because it corresponds to a more or less diverse psychological situation and a fact that is individually and historically conditioned because the fact, again, is always individual. But how to justify the individual and historic ca character of the de definition in as much as it is the solution of that problem and the judgment of the fact? Secondly, the naive and defective description of logicality as representation that is thought finds its point of departure and ground in the concept of the aesthetic as pure and simple representation that is in the typically psychological but nonetheless external and insufficient concept of a pure intuition. See, for example, the problem of aesthetics. So he's reading off of two texts here approaching the aesthetics, mm -hmm. right, which was very prominent in the schools of which he tries to correct in his own version of aesthetics and critique of taste, right? as well as Crochet's logic, you know, and, and his attempt at Hegelian logic. So he goes on to about the theory of, of, sensa you know, of sensations, right? That if given any sensation, if I do not abandon myself to the attractions and repulsions of impulse and sentiment, I find myself in the same disposition as when I enjoy what is usually called a work of art. I live the sensation, but as a purely contemplating spirit. You can imagine what he does with this, because this is, you know, really the worst form of, wow, beautiful artwork, you know, kind of, you know, sayings here, right? Thirdly, the insistence that the illogical act nevertheless possesses the Hegelian character of the thought of the pure concept with its unity or abstract identity is but the natural consequence of Croce's failure to perform the critical task he set himself when he identified defining and individual judgments, right, etc. Right? Um, he psychologizes the, the, the Kantian disinterested aesthetic that was his starting points is compelled to accept the rationalist notion of the aesthetic as an implicit concept and returns inevitably to the pure concept of the Hegelian type. Now, as Derrida shows us many times, there's no such thing as a pure concept. It's always contaminated, right? And this is something we should keep in mind that, that people like Della Volpe, when Derrida is still a kid in Algeria, you know, is recognizing very early on, you know, against Hegel and against, you know, Croce's interpretation of Hegel. You know, and all concepts have contamination. This goes back to the notion of the pharmacon, you know, that implicit in every writing and in every text is both the poison and the remedy, right? And you cannot think of anything as pure, you know, and then in this, in this sense. Or Kant's disinterested aesthetic. That's another thing. We always have a system of interests that are informing the judgment and also the prejudice. And also, Gadamer, from the right, every, everybody brings a prejudice to a text. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a non-prejudicial view of a text. So the text is always con contaminated. We cannot do a pure reading. We cannot do, I have friends that tried to do pure imminent readings back in the day, no such thing, you know, they always flustered, right, et cetera. So he's really taking, taking some of these very naive, you know, moments in Crochean and in some parts of Hegelian thought on, okay? All right, so let me see if I can just highlight the best part of this, okay. Page 234, I'm sorry, Chris, you have a different it's version? Okay. Or the no, other? I can find it. Okay. In sum, begins the paragraph, he accepts Hegel's dialectical version of the principle of nine contradiction with all the historic errors this implies. In opposition to the principle as formulated by Aristotle and an attempt to escape from the absolute identity of Parmenidean being, Croce 
asserts a renovated Eliadism and Platonism in the name of anti-Eliadism, <laughs> Eliadism. At the bottom of all this lies the careless identification of the traditional scholastic principle of identity and its formalist, rationalist treatment of Aristotle's principle with the so-called Parmenidean principle of identity. Yet Croce recognizes, on the contrary, that the individual judgment that excludes its contradictory. On the other hand, although he substantially accepts the principle of identity in its Hegelian version, or perversion in this case seems justified, at bottom he does not consider himself a consistent Hegelian, for his critical intentions prevent this. He rejects the false extension, the defect of the, of the dialectical principle, the defect which is the complete loss of the criterion of distinction. Convinced he can philosophically conciliate the two principles through the theory that distinctions as such are distinctions and not opposites, and opposites cannot be because they are opposition in themselves. Aesthetic fantasy bears within itself its opposite, fantastic passivity, which is the ugly, and thus this is not the opposite of thought, which in its turn bears within itself its opposite logical passivity, its anti-thought, the false. This is an explanation, but it's just not a justification. Okay? So, again, look, he's really trying to take on here that Croce has this claim that he's going to be able to find the pure principle of non-contradiction. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where he, he's going. And Della Volpe, again, is saying that ultimately this, this is an Aristotelian <coughs> category that both Hegel and Croce have not excited, exceeded. They have not gone beyond the Aristotelian. And what you know, does he notion. mean by psychological conception of distinction? He, mean, he means that psychologistic, you, you know, you're bringing instead of a philosophical mind to the problem, you're bringing psychological reasons and you're bringing psychology, you know, ultimately it's called psychologistic, you know, uh, tendencies to any, to the reading or to the framework. So what would an example be? Um, the way people talk on Facebook sometimes, it may seem very logical in a sense, but they're really just throwing their own psychological reasoning and their psychological identity principles onto things rather than thinking it through in a deeper way. But to be fair to Croce, what, what, what is he critiquing in Croce? Oh, you mean in, in, in Benedetto Croce? Yes. He's talking about that he accepts the principle of identity in Hegel, right? Uh, you know, um, in the in the perversion, and does not you know, he does not really understand right the Aristotelian background to that. That's what he's really critiquing. That Aristotle has is the first to think through the principle of non-contradiction. You know, a and not a, right? A a and not a is the beginning of the you know principle of contradiction. How do you resolve the not here, right, into a principle of identity? How do you <laughs> take this and make it an affirmative principle of, that gives identity, right? Okay? And this is the old strata, you know, this is an, in Parmenides in terms of the journey of being and nothingness, right? How is it possible? Well, I began today a little bit with a phrase about the Japanese uh, Marxist samurai who said, I spent 30 years trying to answer the question of nothingness and I still haven't found the answer, right? So in some ways, you know, the, the whole thing is understandable, believe me. So, so the principle of non-contradiction is a resolution of this into, you know, an identity, no longer contradictory. Right? to move forward. So when you're dealing with contradictions in capital, and this is part of our problem today, well, maybe I can elevate this to this uh, study in political economy. When you begin to study you know, capital today, most people are not really dealing with the contradictions. They have set formulas. This is psychologism to the philosophical mind. Mm -hmm. You're not saying this is a contradiction that's operative in fictitious capital basically going back to the ground, right? And not looking at this on levels 
of contradiction. So if you say, why is my mortgage being held by someone in Shanghai? You know, you're dealing with multiple levels of abstraction, right? And multiple levels of being removed from this, but you're not really looking at all the series of contradictions that made that happen. So people are afraid to live in that moment, right? Because it's too complicated to begin to think about how did the not A itself become dominant, right? Or, or did we no, no longer really deal with the is, right? It's in between here. Right? Mm -hmm. We're not really dealing with this anymore. Right. Yeah. We're not really thinking through. Yeah, what were we going to say? I'm sorry. I was just, this is very complicated. Yeah, I know. Stuff. I'm I, I sorry just wanted to say it. I mean, I'm just trying to, mind. you know, I mean, maybe what I should have done is, you know, uh, you know, did some work on Aristotle. We need a course in logic. Yeah, like a course in logic. logic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a logician. Yeah, also, through. earlier he, he uses uh, the term psych psychological or psychology, I forget the formation yeah. of the word, with spiritual, so I just wondered. If, yes. So, and I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, there's a tendency, I mean, you have to remember, again, in Italy, Everything is against the Jesuitism and the Catholicism, especially from this group of thinkers. I mean, you know, especially World War II. I mean, Gramsci's whole thing in the prison notebooks is really to go against the Christian Democratic Party. So remember, these are antagonists politically in, in, the, in the real, you know, in, in terms of the real every day. Right? I'm not saying this is the only answer here. He's looking now actually at another spiritualist tradition. You know, it's open, you know, open up. I mean, as you know, in philosophy, we have a whole tradition around that. Even, even in Descartes, not that he's that way, but it's taken up that way by Malebranche and others. You know, that you have those tendencies in Pascal. You have this, you know, the hidden God, going back to Goldman's, you know, a great book on that, that period. So, so th this is always an antagonistic moment for them. And psychology at this point, you know, again, Freud did not really take big hold in, in Italy as much as it did in France and Italy or psychoanalysis. There were people, not, I mean, obviously, but not to the degree that you had around the Marie Bonaparte and then, of course, the Lacanian schools in France or Ernest Jones and company in, in, in England, right? Or the New York schools with Hardman, Greece, and uh, Lorenstein, right? The eco psychologists. So, so in, in some ways, you know, he's also speaking, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think he's speaking to, you know, this, the Wundtian psychology, the psychology of the 19th century as well, and how this kind of fused with the spiritualist tendency, and that somehow Croce, who became somewhat associated with the Christian Democrats, right? I mean, there's also that playing out as well, right, is indulging himself, <laughs> you know, not in the materiality of the principle of the of the of non contradiction, but I see. staying at the abstract idea, ideational level. Right? So again, I mean I think it's important to remember that, you know, the, the philosopher is always trying to push aside in order to get to the phenomena itself. This is Husserl at work. It's certainly, you know, Freud at work, <laughs> it's certainly, you know, uh, uh, Kant in terms of the distinctions between phenomena and noema, analytical and synthetic judgments, are always trying to push aside, you know, what do we bring as psychological reasoning to the table? That this has to be pushed aside in any kind of knowledge formation or how a concept, because philosophy is really, look, you're going to do a really good course, introductory course of philosophy. You base it on what is an idea, what is a concept, and what is a method. You don't really need much more than that in a basic sense, right, to begin to understand processes of ideation, processes of concept formation, and what path do you take, right? I mean, I'm being very basic here, but not sometimes as simple as, as good, right? So. What he's saying, you know, when you bring the psychologism or the psychological to the table, you're somewhat distorting, at least to the philosophical mind. I'm not saying this is always the case, but you're somewhat distorting the processes of how we synthesize what's actually going on. This is this is I think this That's is where where he's trying to trying to go here, in a way. And he's accusing 
Croce are doing so, and he's actually accusing him as well of this tendency towards almost a spiritual Hegel. Now you see in Coletti, the where we read today again, this Italian Hegelianism. You know, Coletti is is critiquing this this Christian Hegel, that Hegel himself is ultimately guilty about this in terms of a in terms of the the German Protestantism. And basically, you can read German philosophy, you know, from Luther to Hegel, right? And basically, this is the tradition, and the great culmination is here. And then what Marx and Nietzsche do in different ways is dismantle the Hegelian idealism that begins with Lutheran subjectivity. Again, I'm being very basic here. Please don't, you know, I mean, I'm not really saying anything profound. <laughs> but but the, 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 this movement here is about a kind of fulfillment of Protestantism, mm. right, in a way. Yeah? And Nietzsche, of course, whose father is a Protestant pastor, you know, attacks this, you know, and really shows that being and God is dead, and that, you know, and being is an empty fiction mm. in many ways, right? So, in a way, Heidegger takes this back up in a different way, the Lutheran subjectivity through da design analysis and all that. Marx, who's coming out of a very different tradition, I mean, he's read, I mean, you know, he studies philosophy in the German university, and Hegel is the master thinker when he's there, that everybody's talking, he's part of the left-wing Hegelian groups in the man. But Marx, in a way, is dismantling all the religiosity included here because he passes through, you know, for Bakhtian materialism, right? And this is why, and before that, he's passing through Epicurean materialism. So for some reason, Marx, I mean, or Marx has not taken in by the Kantian distinctions, right, or the spheres of distinctions that he accuses Croce of doing, right? in the Hegelian system, right? So, so Marx is, is coming out of this much more sensuous, right, Epicurean tradition, all the way through the sensuous rationality of Feuerbach, and this is part of the formation, if you will, of left Hegelianism, right? But a, a Marxist left Hegelianism, because there's left Hegelianism that doesn't really go to the ultra extremes that Marx does, where there's a complete dis dismantling, a ruthless critique of everything existing. Yeah, uh, that's happening. So, so I, I don't know if this, uh, this hell, I mean, you know, in some ways, the birth of modern subjectivity, I mean, maybe the self-reflexive and reflective consciousness is born in Descartes, the ego, right, is born in the ecological sphere with Descartes. But modern subjectivity is really born with Luther. Yeah, <laughs> in a way. And you, so you're re really playing out a very long trajectory historically from you know, the 16th century to post French Revolution. He moves the text to the subjective reading yes. as opposed to the Jesuitism where you have a hierophant interpreting the text. Yes, always. For yes. Luther, it's the subject mm -hmm. confronting the text. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a very different, you know, strategy. I mean, Chris is good talking about the strategies of reading, you know, how we read, etc. Yeah. I mean, of course, the Gutenberg, you know, galaxy begins, you know, uh, in this. So, so I mean, I think Coletti, going back to Coletti, who's very well aware of how the Jesuits, you know, uh, practice and what Christian democracy did. Croce becomes a figure of Italian Hegelianism who is, who is going to become the antagonist to a whole new generation of Marxists because of one, his influence on Gramsci, and two, you know, his influence, if you will, on the Christian Democratic Party and in his lack of being a left. I mean, you know, again, he's really trying to show the idealism that's playing out here. I was really, really trying to show that. So, yeah, anyway, um, so, I mean, you know, the, the difference is, for Marx, you know, this Furbachian materialism 
is really a, a, a very crucial moment in the development of Marxist thinking, even though all the elements were there in the 1841 uh, dissertation. The Forbachian moment, the principles for the philosophy of the, of the future, as well as on the essence of Christianity. If anybody started to kill God, or at least the Christian God, it was Ludwig uh, Forbach. And by the way, that book was translated by George Eliot from German into English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, very, very important to, again, remember that. So, so anyway, but Coletti and, and Delavolpe, Delavolpe first, there's this return to Kant, right, in a sense, because what they want to do is show that this is really about real opposition and that somehow you have that in Marx, right? That Marxists have forgot, you know, in terms of the construction of a lot of the categories in, 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 in capital. Mm -hmm. And we'll go over that more extensively. I mean, I don't know if we're going to have, a, you know, a whole, a whole time to do that. But I can do that vis-a-vis -vis Negre and, you know, go back to the Italian school. We're going to really talk about a term in Kant and, and in... Uh, real opposition and uh, and how this works you know in Marx and, and around the thing in itself again mm -hmm. so let me let me just point out something else since you know we're gonna probably I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to do too much uh, angling angular thinking here but you know, I think it's okay in some ways because um, when Heidegger 1929 is the Davos conference and which is very famous in terms of philosophical discourse, when the thing in itself is talked about between Ernst Cassirer, the great philosopher of the Enlightenment, you know, uh, commentator, etc., who ended up at the Warburg Institute, very delightful, you know, uh, cosmopolitan man, and the peasant Heidegger, and Heidegger supposedly wiped the floor with Cassirer, right, on the thing in itself, saying that Kant recoiled in the New Emerald realm, you know, mm -hmm. from the abyssal plain, right? And was unable to see, <laughs> you know, that this could be confronted and looked at and we must stare at it. And this plays out later in On the Line with Ernst Jünger, you know, et cetera. You know, Jünger would say, let's cross it. Heidegger would say, no, let's examine it a little longer. And all this on, on borderline, you know, what was called the limit situation by Karl Jaspers, you know. Yeah. So Heidegger was not afraid of anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, and this was not in his, you know, so in a way, th this starts something going on in philosophy about, you know, <laughs> this Kantian thing in itself. You know, how will we, you know, confront this abyssal plane? You know, and of course the problem of dying, the problem of death itself, you know, death is a master from Germany, which the Lons, a uh, uh, great, great poem, you know, um, et cetera. So from there, you know, th this becomes a real issue, right, in philosophy. Yeah? So the return to Kant, you know, Coletti wants to argue in some ways on the side of Cassirer, that he had something really going on against Heidegger. He doesn't say it against Heidegger, but the Cassirer you know, who they read. I don't think they, these guys really read it. They knew of Heidegger and they maybe read a little bit, but I don't think there was ever the encounter that you got from the Greeks like Exelos and Castellanos, and, uh, or from certainly the French with Sartre, Lefebvre, Althusser, and almost every major French thinker. I don't think the Italians did that much. Um, so, so anyway, getting up, back up to, to Coletti. Coletti is the one who really tries to return to Kant you know, this is an attempt. One of the reasons I wanted to read this is at least to give a little bit of a background that there is a Kantian Marxism that's not only Jean-Francois Lyotard's postmodern return to Kant, but there is a, you know, a kind of an attempt at a materialist return to Kant, right, in the Marxian tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, Lyotard sort of broke with Marx. Marx was part of the grand narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas for Coletti, and Della Volpe, Kant could be incorporated back in, right? So, Leo, I mean, Leotard in a certain way went the ray of the aesthetic, right? Lectures on the sublime in Kant, 
the postmodern is a rereading of the critique, the third critique, mm -hmm. um, in some way, in, in that way. Uh, Colvetti. What book of Leotard's it discusses the return to Kant? He doesn't discuss it, he does it. It's a book on, on Kant's theory of the sublime. Okay. Yeah. You know, where, where Leotard would say the sublime is the thing in itself, <laughs> right? We must look at the sublime. And you get this whole slew of articles. I'm sorry I do this, but I think it's important. You get a whole slew of articles, the nuclear sublime, you know, when Reagan comes into power. This becomes a major thing. Francis Ferguson at Berkeley, you know, the nuclear sublime and Wordsworth. You begin to get a, this whole new venture into the sublime, right? Right? So, so anyway, but Della Volpe is going to do this through the aesthetics, right, in taste. Reread the sh sections on taste in the third critique. And this is, again, a failure of our educational system, in my opinion. We don't read primary texts. Mm -hmm. We read the contemporary stuff that's basically derivative. We're not really reading, you know, in and even in philosophy, you take a course on ancient philosophy, you don't really read a whole lot of Aristotle seriously for a long time unless you become a specialist, right? You don't really read, you read Platonic dialogues, you discuss them, but you don't really become broad, you know, in the sense of understanding all of this. So th this is always a problem. So anyway, and this is why this is, becomes hard to yeah. read because it's not Slavo Zizek, you know, telling six jokes and, uh, you know, yeah. you know, and Hegel stuck it to so-and-so, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, at this moment, right, et cetera. Even though he understands, obviously, the principle of non-contradiction. He's just a popularizer. Yes. He's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a place for popularizing. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not knocking. I mean, I'm just saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why he's popular. <laughs> <laughs> His best book, by the way, in my opinion, is that sublime object of ideology, mm. mm -hmm. by far. If you're going to read one thing of Zizek and study it. That is, a, that is, to me, is his masterpiece. Yeah, yeah, really a great book. And that's about Kant, too. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating for a return. I'm just trying to say <laughs> this was certainly on the agenda, right? Mm -hmm. In many ways, post-World War II, and again, post-May of 68. So if you want to start thinking, you know, if you want to, you know, kind of ways of looking at philosophy and what's happening, you know, you have this period of post-World War II leading up to 68 <coughs> and then post-68, and you have two different moments of a return to Kant mm -hmm. <coughs> in this, right? Right? Yeah. And of course, the Hegelian Marxists, you know, Zizek considers himself a Hegelian. Mm -hmm. Well, in Less Than Zero is his Hegelian yes. piece, book. Right. right. Many people say that's his masterpiece. I don't. Well, well I, it's okay. I'm not I'm glad the man here. Yeah, yeah, it's a question of judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can give reasons, but I don't want to go. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, the less than zero is the not A. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a Lacanian analysis of Hegel. Yes. But, you know, to me, sometimes there's a problem if you're going to psychoanalyze the entire history of philosophy. <laughs> Even if you're Lacan too, who knew philosophy very well, very well trained in it, and I think he learned a lot from, you know, the attendance of Kojev's lectures on Hegel. You know, and Lacan has tremendous Hegelian tendencies, no question about it. But he also wrote a great piece called Kant of Exod, in which he talks about the Kantian system itself has already anticipated all of the Marquis design. All the perversions are in the Kantian critique of pure reason. <laughs> I know, Chris. I saw your face there. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to absorb okay. that, yeah, process yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, he says it's all, all already there. Con From intuition to concepts, intuitions are blind without concepts. It's a little less exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. without yeah. Kant, we'd have no Dasad. We we, no. That he has anticipated schematically what Desaad's doing. We would have had to decide anyway, but Kant was there that had the schema already there to, you know, incorporate this. 
This was Lacan's, you know, kind of, yeah. It's a good piece. It's out there. I think it's in English. Yeah, yeah, it's in English. Sad, sad avec, uh, you know, uh, can't avec ça. Can't with ça. With, uh, yeah, with the ça. I don't know. Very interesting. You no, know, my students have never heard of the Marquise de Sade or Sand or Massa. Uh-huh. They're, they're innocent. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be prepared for the robots, huh? <laughs> They, they just have work. That step on the they way. They just work. Uh, they just work. It's true. Uh, it's true. true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So anyway, to 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 go back uh, here. So again, you have these. Uh, uh, listen, I, I'm trying to be, you know, uh, obviously very schematic here with the history. But the 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 1945, right? You begin to get this tendency in in Italy, right? With Della Volpe, Coletti, and a few others, but Della Volpe and Coletti being the two major representatives where there's a return to a Kantian Marxism. In Coletti's case, the whole tradition's full of it because they misunderstood the dialectic of matter. You know, if you read that piece. That was easier? I guess it was easier because Della Volpe is more technical. The student is easier. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So so, so you have this, this movement, right? At that time, a return to a kind of Kantian Marxism around, around an anti-Crochian Hegelianism, right? That was faulty, and also in Coletti's case, against a whole materialist interpretation of the dialectic, you know, that is Hegelian based, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, these are the two things. Yeah, what were we going to say? Go ahead. No, I wasn't going to say anything. Okay. 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 Um, so. So you have the, 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 these moments, right, of where the Kantian moment of real contradiction, and I'll, I'll tell you where it is in the Paletti. So, yeah. Um, I mean, this is a beautiful paragraph here. Well. I was actually in another chapter. I believe I didn't sign that one. But anyway, um, okay. Let me let me just look at the, the end of the uh, Coletti, the last uh, paragraph, mm-hmm. right? The meaning and function of the dialectic of matter in Hegel's thought is that in his own words, it certainly constitutes an essential moment of all religious consciousness. Here's your spirituality and your psychological <laughs> thing right here, right, uh, Chris? Yeah. Okay. However, the meaning that the dialectic of matter has in Engels and in Lenin is, is quite well known is quite different. It represents for them the most advanced and developed form of materialism. So Coletti is claiming, rather, you know, originally, if you will, and took the risk of saying that somehow Marxism became a religion. It was about a religious consciousness in some ways. One might presume at this point, under the common name, there must lie two different conceptions. In reality, this hypothesis must be dismissed. The lengthy comparison of text which we indulged in, which he did throughout, he went to the science of logic primarily, and some of Lenin and some of Marx's appropriation. And the others that we'll present below proves, it seems to me, two things. That all the basic propositions of the dialectic of matter, this is the end part, were originally formulated by Hegel, and that dialectical materialism has consigned, confined itself by transcribing these propositions from the texts, from Tegel's text. Since the authors of dialectical materialism, in the process of recopying them, and who are the authors of dialectical materialism? Engels, Plekhanov, right? Mm-hmm. Have made clear they understood these, sta- sta- these statements to imply a materialist stance already in Hegel's text. The conclusion must be drawn, I believe, that they simply committed an error of interpretation. 
and an error which he thinks lies at the bottom, Coletti, at the basis of theory, a century of theoretical Marxism. So the whole tradition of Hegelian Marxism, according to Coletti, Coletti has been mis a misrepresentation. I've heard a lot of people say that Hegel is a materialist. Yeah, well, he's, talking, he's just demystifying this thing. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, he, there are many people who have said this. Yeah, but it seems to me he's an idealist. First and foremost. Well, I mean, Coletti and Della Volpe's claim to go back again, it's from Luther to Hegel. Mm -hmm. And that this is playing out in a very long way, and as well that ultimately it is about the sphere of religion and philosophy that cannot be disjoined and severed in a radical way. See, in the spheres of Hegel, there are three basic spheres there's the art, religion, and philosophy. And I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have it today. I'll, I'll make a diagram of this next time. I'm going to do something you know, around this. So these are the three spheres of where the dialectic emerges. The divisions. Art, religion, and philosophy. The problem in Hegel, ultimately, is that these two, and the way philosophy is taught, these two are always intertwined. The philosophy remains a kind of theology. Mm -hmm. Right? Remains a kind of theology. And what Coletti and Della Volpe are trying to do in different ways is separate one through the principle of non-contradiction, right? <laughs> the other one through a return to Kant in a different mm -hmm. way are trying to sever this relationship. Yeah. To sever this relationship. Yeah, what were you going to say? Good luck. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the real question you want to ask here in religious term, is Kant the Jew and, and uh, Hegel the Christian in all of this, <laughs> right? But it seems like they so they substitute it with science or Kantian science in a way, and that doesn't seem like it has any less religious overtones to me than than just a sort of Hegelian, you know, spiritualism in a, in a way. I don't well, know. I guess it's, hard, it's hard. for me it's hard to say. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if Kant. Uh, is uh, basically the science in Kant. I mean, you know, in some ways, what, what, what's really going on here, if you want to read the political economy of the moment mm -hmm. and the physics of the moment, is Kant is really the Copernican revolution mm -hmm. that takes into account the time of capital, which is Newtonian time. Okay. Okay, so I mean, this, this is one thing that you could think about in terms of the Kant is really the, the Copernican revolution for Kant in thinking mm -hmm. is the adjustment to Newtonian time and physics. Mm -hmm. You know, Heidegger is attempting to do this, of course, with quantum right. and relativity in a different way. If you want to read philosophy, you know, instead of saying that, you know, it's these spheres of art, religion, and philosophy that are unfolding dialectically in history, if you want to read science, philosophy, or as Althusser puts it, science ideology, mm -hmm. or as Sartre puts it, if you read your Marxism and existentialism for today, mm -hmm. there are no philosophies, there are only ideologies, right? right? There's only science. Right. So really where they're going here, you know, when you mention that, work, is they're trying to really build the science right. of the concrete, yeah. right? Of concrete relations, right? And for them, the Hegelian moment in Croce, and for Coletti, as you say, a hundred years, which would include Lukács, Kozhev, you know, all the Hegelian Marxists, which are very long, all the way up to Zizek, mm -hmm. right, etc. I'm not so sure about Badiou. But, but anyway, this, all of this moment is based on a false yeah. premise, is what he's cl claiming. Yeah. And also remember, 1956, as I mentioned earlier, was a time, even though Coletti's writing this in the seven, late 60s and 70s, you know, still the de-Stalinization and, and the haunting of dialectical materialism, Diamat, right, is still haunting the left in terms of the philosophy. How is it possible that we would come to the point of gulags and, and this kind of uh, terror? Right. I'm not saying I'm not against this. Right. I mean, to be honest with you. You're anyway. not against the gulags? <laughs> well, I don't know what the I mean, um, how many were there really? <laughs> <laughs> like mom, you know? Like, you know? A million people versus 75. I mean, you know, you have to keep these things in perspective. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> Marx and Nietzsche are, are, are on the same page. You do not have civilization without slavery. Right? And Aristotle. 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> and Aristotle, too, right? Yeah, well, Aristotle's <laughs> the one that they used to justify uh, <laughs> slavery, a reading of Summer Slaves by Nature. Which he didn't, I mean, you know, that's another, <laughs> another story, of which Rousseau argues against in, like, 2,000 years later. Any, anyway, I mean, look, I, I, again, um, the, 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 the question really is, again, that if Marxism considers itself, Marxism as a science, mm -hmm. and Marx and Engels certainly thought that they were scientists, right? That they would give a scientific... The, the question is, you know, how do you build this, right? Mm -hmm. What are the conditions of how you build it? And you're not going to build it through Hegelian spirituality yeah. or Hegelian things. And he's trying to uncover how this happens. Yeah. He's trying to expose it, if you will. And in Coletti's case, he thinks that the Marxists, right, in terms of thinking through things, just in Hegelian terms, leads out the concept of, of real opposition. Yeah, it leaves it out completely. So this first chapter by Coletti is about the dialectic of matter. Mm -hmm. You know, how does dialectical materialism, how does the dialectic of nature come to be what it is, you know, in a sense. And we can get go back to this, I mean, look, we can do this thematically where the dialectics of nature, of which is a book by Engels, you know, <laughs> uh, we, can, we can look at that and see how Sartre is going to engage that in the beginning of the critical and the uh, dogmatic dialectic at the, at the beginning of the critique of dialectical reason. Because you begin to start thinking about this, is matter determinate as an outside principle all the time? Mm -hmm. Or again, what is the movement and the layers and relations within this, which is much more dialectical thinking than just saying, that's the material. You know, and this begins to separate out vulgar Marxism, mm -hmm. mechanical Marxism, mm -hmm. right? Automatic Marxism, from, you know, I think a much more open-ended Marxism. And to me, the reason to read these people, it goes to show you, you know, where the openings are and yeah. where the clo closings are and how this, you know, ultimately plays out. And I know it's sophisticated. I mean, you know, these are, th these are written for a philosophical yeah. audience. They also have historical, they have also historical um, stakes. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really to justify their wing of the party. Right. Right against the party that still follows the Gramscian line, right. you know, the Hegelian, Croatian Marxism, which they, they see Gramsci doing. I, again, I love Gramsci, you know, in a sense, and, but I understand that this kind of, these kind of stakes change, and capital's relations change, too. I mean, we have no theory of uh, technological capital on the Marxist thing. Yeah. We're always extending from the old. We don't, we don't rupture into something new when the new formations take place. You know, we'll go to the ecological. They're all good. Andreas Malm, you know. Uh, the metabolical uh, rift. Metabolical rift and John Bellamy Foster. You know, There's the, a dialectical materialist right, right. view of nature. It is. It is a dialectical materialist view of nature. Yeah, what were we going to say, David? Oh, yeah, actually, I was just thinking, but um, I was wondering, is, is the, was the Italian... Communist Party more tolerant of dissent than the French? Not especially. They tolerated these yeah. fellows more than the French yeah. would. It became, we used to laugh like the country club, a yuppie organization in the 80s. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons that, yeah. I mean, you know, listen, post World War II, these were heavyweights Coletti, Della Volpe, Prezzo, Luperini as part of the, the group, and then, then you had these, these splits that started, you had the workerism group, Trompti and Negre and others, Magri who stayed a member of the, of the party, these were all major, major figures, you know, really thoughtful people and extremely militant and, and uh, extremely militant. These were not just purely academic. They write, I mean, Della Volpe writes more like an academic. I think Coletti is more accessible, but he, he really writes like a, a technical philosopher, you know, to a degree. You know, if you don't have this background, see, I think for people like Josh, critique of taste would be better because he gives examples from painting, sculpture, you know, and he's the thing. Whereas this is really based on Aristotelian, Kantian uh, logic, you know, in, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, they had internal fights big time. You know, a lot of people left the party. I mean, Negre, Negre, they were totally against, uh, they don't even mention Gramsci. And I think it's partially because they hated, they really didn't like the Peachy. Yeah. 
They didn't like the, the, the where where it went. Yeah. But yeah, these were very and, and you know in in fact these people helped a lot of people get jobs. If you were a member of a party, you were able to get an academic job in certain regions. And Bologna is a stronghold of Reds, the Bologna Reds. You know, really, this is where a lot, a lot of militancy came out of. And in my opinion, these people did the most original work in the 70s. Lazzarato, Ferrari, uh, Bifo, um, all these people, um, um, what's his name, uh, it's another guy, um, uh, Mafazeni, um, you know, our friend Sandro Mazzaro and Borders. Uh, these are people that really emerged. You know, La Lazzarato went to, uh, went to uh, Paris and he studied with Deleuze, but he also brought all this background with him and he's able to write excellent books on the making of Indebted Man. You know, this is major, major work. It's regional, but it's major regional work. You know, it's not like, you know, Husserl's going to write the logical investigation or Freud's interpretation of dream. Nobody's capable of this stuff anymore. We don't have the time, nor do we, you know, the stakes are very different, you know. <laughs> in a lot of ways. You know, we're not going to get those breakthroughs. Nobody's going to rewrite. You know, the attempt should be made to write the fourth volume of Capital, you know, the, the circuit of derivative, you know, money derivative back into money, right? To write the new circuit of Capital outside of M prime. You know, how does M prime morph into derivatives? That's totally fictional to, to, pay, to play the market derivatives. You might as well, in, like spiders or indexes. Those are so small. Those are simple derivatives. Yes, <laughs> not right. spiders. Right, right. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Those are simple derivatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the strategies that are involved in that too, which you know takes much. Yeah, you know, and you know how do you read algorithms today? You know how the machine de determines things. These are things that Marx certainly would comprehend and, and be able to write about today, but he's not here, so there was never really a kind of leg, you know, there's a great critical legacy left, of course, but at the same time, that legacy does not include, you know, categories. We need, we're in, sorry, I mean, this is what, quote, radical imagination or what, you know, we should really be about, is how do you determine and think through new categories and new concepts? And this is one thing that you do in philosophy, and why I think these are things are worth reading. What is the you know what is the difference between intuition and concept? You know what's really going on. What is an idea? You know we have nothing but recycled ideas. Everything's derivative today. You know it's it's yeah it's very hard to go go beyond this. Yeah. So we have to think what what is going to be new <laughs> in this. What are we really detecting here? And how do you form new new categories? Is it all about oh that's not just, that's not right, you know this this seems to be the reaction. This is the psychologism that he's speaking about too. It becomes a new religiosity, a new kind of in, in my my mind a new kind of um, you know formal spiritualism. There's no difference between Marxism and, and the church. You know it becomes a new religion, you know, in some ways because it's based in identity logic. See, what you're trying to get out of is the logic of identity. Mm -hmm. This is ultimately what this is about. Mm -hmm. How do you get out of the logic of identity? Yeah. How do you begin to mark and, you know, rupture to difference itself, right? Yeah. And that's where you're going to get it. Unfortunately, we're all hemmed, <laughs> hemmed in by this identity logic. It's very easy to point and say, that's that, that's that, that's mm -hmm. that, you know. I think, I think this is, you know, part, part of the parcel of the problem. Yeah. So the, the, the thing about reading people and then reading Sartre on method, you know, is that it gives us a sense of maybe what the stakes are philosophically, how you would build the new path, right, for the understanding and how would you begin to create new categories. I mean, David Harvey's going to do capital for free, and I'm not dissuading anybody for going, but you're going to get explication. You're not going to get a radical reinterpretation of capital in there. You're not going to get a dialogical. With all due respect, I mean, it's great what he's doing. I mean, you know, tremendous admiration. But at the same time, you know, to me, to my mind, it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a really a critical reassessment, you know, what's going on in Italy in terms of that, that tradition, you know, or trying to think it through at another level. 
Yeah. So th- I think this is important for us to, to recognize. And I'm not really just talking about the level of theory because this translates into practice. I mean, we'll see what this yellow vest movement develops, morphs into in Paris. But again, <laughs> I, I would, you know, rephrase Kant, without theory, practice is blind. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> you know, this is very important. You know, without concepts, intuitions are blind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in a lot of ways, and I, I think this is something we should really understand going forward. Is it going to be same same stuff? Now the police wear yellow vests. Yes, mm-hmm. right here, identity. Logic well, wouldn't work. Mark say that the, the proletariat? I wore a red vest yesterday. You know. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't. I, I was completely confused yeah. on the signifier of that, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, didn't didn't Marx say that the proletariat will rise up when the time is right with proletarian consciousness without having a theory of why they were rising up? They don't need the theory. The theory has to be. I mean, that's the whole idea of the Leninist vanguard. I mean, that's that's what Lukács is really writing history and class consciousness about is to develop the vanguard, develop the theoretical advantage, which really speaks for, you know, nothing is too good. Peter Bratz just likes to say nothing's too good for the working class. The real phrase is nothing's too good for the representatives of the working class. That's the vanguard (laughs) assessment, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, but no, I mean, the proletarian consciousness, yes, of course, you're giving giving consciousness, and, and, and to, to put it mildly... It's rough but, and, and yeah, raw. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Marx is a theoretician. Marx wasn't, you know, an uh, you know, electrical uh, electrician or a plumber. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was, you know, he was an academic. I mean, turned, re- you know, revolutionary. I mean, you know, th- this is not... Yeah. He's a failed academic. He couldn't get a job. I don't think he really wanted one. There, there's an <laughs> existential <laughs> comic. What's that? There's an existential comic about Marx looking for a job, <laughs> and they tried it with his qualifications. What is he able to do? And finally, they ma- they take him to Walmart and make him a greeter. <laughs> and he greets the people. You know, they have yeah, yeah, greeters in Walmart. He greets people with passages from Capital yelling at them and <laughs> he gets fired <laughs> yeah, of couldn't hold a job there's the thing about his penmanship you know as an early man he would go to, to jobs and he could you know his penmanship was so awful nobody would he hire couldn't be a clerk couldn't, yeah, couldn't be a clerk right yeah yeah couldn't write you know he had no, no good penmanship but again I mean look the, 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 the point is here this was a very active you know I mean, we're here in the United States. This was a party, you know, this is like, you know, um, a real party with a lot of force, Mm. a lot of membership, right? And these guys are writing, you know, they come out of the Comintern and out of the Politburo mentality that you, you know, you have to write good theory and you're always in a critique of each other constantly, you know, but you're writing it out, you know, you're not just like Trump with the Twitter. Or, or you know this this uh, or you're not just using MSNBC or Fox News. These people have really wanted to think this through. Yeah. And you know, as I mentioned on Wednesday, and I mentioned this again, for Marx, you know, philosophy was the head, and the body of the revolution was the proletariat. You know, the heart. He, he used this head and heart metaphor constantly. The head is the, the philosophy, and the heart was the the, the proletariat. Yeah, in many ways. So when you talk about proletarian consciousness, where's the consciousness come from? I mean, does the does the worker go home and read Aristotle every night? No, he no. Beca- he yeah. he gets fed up with the material conditions of his work. Right, of his existence. Yeah, and then the work. Yes, right, right. And he begins to understand how he's reproducing himself and how he's reproducing the system, and then certain a critical consciousness hopefully will emerge, and this may take place you know, in conversations with fellow workers, or I never thought about things that way, or, or something like that. Not to say that the vanguard knows best. That's not the question. The vanguard should be in possession, and I, I'm not saying that we have a vanguard or that I'm totally advocate, because I know plumbers who can really talk the talk, too, you know, and... And, and Lonnie know, Anderson. And, yeah, yeah, and Lonnie Pamela and, Anderson. Pamela, Pamela, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, the, the issue is, is much more about, yeah, the time, what's really stolen by capital is not your money, 
really only, right? It's really your time. Oh, yeah. That's what's really being stolen out here is time. Time to read, time to reflect. You know, my students are exhausted in class. Oh, professor, you know, I, I got two jobs, you know, et cetera. This is sure. what's been created. We're not in the 1960s or early 70s anymore where people could, you know, talk in jail about ideas. <laughs> you know, you don't, you get very little of that today or where people come into classrooms full of ideas and full of outrage at the system. Everybody's too too exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, we or used to talk about the, 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 the little literature of exhaustion. Basically, now it's the workplace of exhaustion that allows no one to think. It can be, you know, moved around, and this is the basis of consumerism. Mm -hmm. You exhaust mm -hmm. people to the point of where I shop, therefore I exist, mm -hmm. or I buy and I feel better. This is my way out of depression. It's the first thing they said after 9-11, everybody get up and go out and buy, shop. Right. That's what Bush said. Yes, that's right. Yeah. We have, yeah, yeah. W. Yeah. The, the young one. The new statesman of the family. <laughs> it's the Papa, Papa Doc, Papa Doc Bush died, huh? Baby Doc, Baby Doc Bush is still alive. Yes, right. I thought Prescott, the, the, the grandfather, was the, yeah, the, the, he was the early fascist in the family, right? <laughs> right. So, anyway, I mean, you know, to go back to this, I mean, Coletti states are really about a whole tradition in Marxism that is misinterpreted. And again, they're trying to explain Stalinism at one level. At one level, they're trying to explain it. How does this dialectic of matter and this Hegel, Hegelian phrase, and this is a phrase that, uh, I mean, or, or proposition that is always out there. The real is the rational, and the rational is the real. Where are the contradictions in this, right? Hitler's an actuality. Is that rational? Right? I mean, in a sense. There was a whole tradition that said Hegelian thinking, and this proposition <coughs> led to the state, to the Nazi state. This is actually, Kassira wrote a book called The Myth of the State, which is very interesting, by the way, on, on myth, the myth used in the construction of the state. It's a very good book. I, I recommend reading it. Yeah, Marence Kassira, the Kantian philosopher. Yeah philosophy and enlightenment. He's very good. Yeah. Um, so this this proposition is really one of the stakes. Is Stalin a necessary, you know, moment of Leninism? Do we evolve to this in, in Diamat and dialectical materialism? Is that is that happening? Yeah. Is that is that part of the movement? Or is there something else? So why does Coletti go back to real opposition? in Kant. Well, he wants to undo, right, the real as rational, right? So there is this return to the Kantian, you know, and it really in a political sense because Kant's politics is Rousseau. You know, we, you know the story, he read the social contract and he lost his daily constitution, you know, on the way, on the walk, <laughs> right, by one day, right? <laughs> right. So, anyway, um, so, yeah, try, try to think it through here because this was a Hegelian, uh, you know, a very well-known Hegelian opposition, right? And and in these dialectical spheres, because Hegel, as I pointed out earlier, is always working in spirals. I mean, I gave you a two-dimensional diagram today, horizontal and vertical, of Plato, the theory of ideas. But think about spheres unfolding, dialectical spheres, right? How does this happen in history, right? Of which. The major spheres, three major spheres, art, religion, and philosophy. These are your three major spheres. So he writes a four-volume aesthetics. He writes lectures on the history and philosophy of religion, and he writes lectures on the history of philosophy. He writes a logic, and he writes a phenomenology of what? The Geist, but translated as spirit. You know, Zeitgeist is the spirit of the times. So where do we get the spirituality from? It's in the language to a degree. You know, Jameson wants to, you know, now <laughs> retranslate Geist as community. 
the phenomenology of the community. Well, what community, first of all? <laughs> you know, what, 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 what do we have in terms of real, real community? So, so, but again, so what, what they're really trying to do is show that sometimes this construction of the sphere, right, and the spherical dialectic does not really resolve always the contradictions as it claims, right? <laughs> and that it ultimately, you know, you have to go back to Kant in order to set the matter straight, the dialectic of matter straight. This is what, what it's saying. Because Hegel claims that the dialectical resolutions are a resolution of the contradictions. It will lead to new contradictions. Mm -hmm. This is why Lenin and others were so taken by this. They think about it, you know, because if you're looking at capital and all its co contradictions, right, you begin to see that, you know, a contradiction is resolved at one level, but it leads to new contradictions in the system. So, of course, this Hegelian Marxism is very, uh, very, uh, you know, attractive and very operative. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, yeah, again, I mean, in the future, maybe we can do a, um, uh, 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 you know, a, a course on, on Kant and Hegel and that relationship and, and kind of think it through in terms of what did it mean to the Marxist tradition, mm -hmm. you know, in a different way. You know, not only Kant and the relation to the French Revolution or Kantian studies, but what did it really mean to, you know, a whole Marxist tradition. Because, you know, Sartre, if you looked at this too, I mean, I know I, there was a lot of sign today, and, uh, but in the dogmatic dialectic, this is a Kantian distinction, dogmatism and critical philosophy, you know, in here. So this is a very interesting thing. Um, I think this will help us at least as markers, you know. I mean, again, this book is worthy of, you know, two, three years of study and, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty massive work, you know, I mean, you know, and, and I, I really think we're in serial thinking, which is a part of this, and I'll point to that, as well as the practical inert. This is the old version, it has a nice photo of him very militantly on the barricades, uh, you know, <laughs> during May of 68, of which de Gaulle, when they arrested him, you can't put Voltaire in jail. <laughs> So he did have a privileged uh, existence with uh, those kind of things, yeah, yeah. And in my opinion, you know, one of the great, uh, you know, great figures in 20th century thought and action, you know, yeah. I mean, he, he lived his philosophy. He lived it. He tried to live a life of good faith, for which he, you know, he wrote out. And I think part of the problem is, is that the Derridian attempt to turn this into texts to me, did him a great disservice. With all due respect to Danny Don, the ability to read and you know problematize things, that they did, diluted a lot of the Sartrean you know moment in terms of real in what life. book does he? Oh, they, a lot of the Derridians uh, went after Sartre in terms oh. of the deconstructing you know his lack. His Not Danny Don himself. Well, Danny Don says I loved him, but he was wrong about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there. things like this, you know. I I, I go sometimes to that ad hominem, like you know, before I go to sleep, I do the short <laughs> no, I, Yeah, no, I'm not praying. Yeah, yeah. P R E Y I N G, but not 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 the other. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, the, uh, the sections I'm searching for method are in the Marxist Internet uh, yeah. archives. I yeah. 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 Good. Uh, good. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a yeah. I mean, maybe I can do this maybe next time because I know these Italian, they, they're kind of difficult. Why don't we do this on the 19th? I'll go back with maybe a better explication. Why don't we look at this? This is a little easier to, to situate if you have it. If you had, I don't know if you had a chance to read it. The search for a method, right? Yeah. yeah, the Marxism, the Marxism and, existentialism. and existentialism. And I can nice maybe method. situate this text for a little while and you know we'll kind of have a little breathing room and stuff and then I'll try to think of some way of really um, um, you know uh, giving you a, a explication of the principle of non-contradiction uh -huh. the excluded middle all these kind of logical terms that Coletti and, uh, yeah. uh, and um, Della Volpe are throwing around yeah. easily by the way I do recommend in this book this is the last before he went the way of, um, of Berlusconi Right? <laughs> yeah. Really? Uh, the way of all flesh. Is that right? He did. Wow.
He became an apologist for Ber Berlusconi in the end. He left the party. Your friend. He said I'm Marx was not a scientist. There was no science here. Everything that he's trying to claim and, and engage. Uh, there yeah, is that, really? Yeah, yeah. So I, I have a note. I don't know where this is coming from. I said, you <laughs> see Cesare Luparini's 1961 study on Kant on space and matter. So I mean, there must be some wealth. I don't know why I, I put that here. But anyway. Um, okay. So I, I do recommend, if you really want to look at this, Kant, Hegel, and Marx, Chapter 8 in this book would really maybe give you a good sense of who Coletti is and where he was going. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't sign in the beginning. Kant we just have so much time. It's oh, and Kant, Hegel, and Kant, Marx. Hegel, and Marx, <laughs> Chapter 8, and in the Verso edition it begins on page 113. It's Chapter 8. Yeah. Maybe you can also say something about the fall, I hate to say it, of the Communist Party in Italy. Today? Or no, no, there's no, no such thing? Fact, yeah. What, exactly that? what I mean. In other words, what, what happened to the party? Well, they lost their best minds. I yeah. mean, number one, they, I mean, the people such as Negre, Basaglia, um, um, all uh, Piperno, Franco Piperno, Paolo Verno, all these people left. I mean, they, they were never really there with them since the 60s. 61 is really the beginning of a, 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 a major split. You can see this in the movies, too. You know, you begin to see this in Antiononi with the landscapes of the industrialized, you know, de-industrialized Italy. Some beautiful things. Red Desert, in one way, is a, is a, a vision of this. And, and during that period, it's when Negre is working with the, uh, with the workers. You know, they're, they're doing all kinds of very strong work, and they say the party is not even halfway up to the job. So this is the beginning of a real, real split. Della Volpe, as I said, he became, he stayed in the party, you know, but Coletti, completely frustrated. And then, of course, you know, the issue for Coletti was, is Marx science, you know? And this was always a debate, you know, is this scientific, ultimately? Does it work like, you know, physics? He goes you know. to Berlusconi, and how seriously can you take it? Well, of course. <laughs> no, that's, well, later. I think you take them seriously during this yes. period. No, no, I mean, I want to say that. I mean, you know, in some ways, yes. But Sidney Hook you take ser seriously early. You don't take Sidney Hook seriously in the 1950s and 60s in my, my, my book, you know? But, but when he's what, yeah. what happened to... Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 maybe we can talk about that in terms of concepts, yeah? More than, you know, what, what, what the stakes were, yeah, in some ways. All right, well, so anyway, I, I recommend if you have the chance and time, I know everybody's time is limited, but the Kant, Hegel, Marx chapter maybe give you a better kind of uh, understanding. Maybe if, if I do this again, I'd begin with that and then mm -hmm. go back to the dialectic of matter. Yeah. But anyway, I don't, yeah, but anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember many, many years ago, Leonard Coletti, and um, you know, I just got to the part where there can't be any contradiction because reality is just reality. Right. And I thought that was so simple-minded. Yeah, simplistic. that's where he went ultimately. Yeah. Simplistic that it didn't. You know, yeah, that's that. That was his his back. Yeah, that was his way out of the party, or out of the, the Marxist position. The reality ultimately is not, you know, can be found in this. So that was his later thinking. signs of his later. Yeah, he deteriorated. deteriorated. No question about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And at least the result was going. So yes. All right. So um, anyway, um, let me let me just do one little quick thing just to put Della Volpe in another um, context. Uh, you know. Um, Della Volpe's ambition was really to give a scientific logic for a priori speculation. Mm -hmm. That's what he was really trying to do, to give a real logic to this a priori. And, um, um, and he said there's only one logic that one would do, and this is the logic of positive science, is the, the uh, experimental science. So in some ways he's Galilean. And in the reason you have the chapters on Gal Galileo, mm -hmm. as well as Baconian in a different way, you know, in terms of Francis Bacon's experimental model in in England, which of course led to the Royal, Royal uh, Academy of Science. Okay, so um, he uses Marx. Let me let me just point this out, and we'll go to Sartre. He uses Marx. He thinks there are two fundamental texts in Marx 
for scientific, um, um, uh, you know, uh, experimental science. 1844 manuscripts, which we engaged, at least from the standpoint of alienation, right? And the 1857, which is a negative dialectic, he thinks, the, the, the Paris manuscripts, and the 1857 critique of political economy, which he thinks is a positive dialectic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is interesting to know that the four categories, you know, the exchange, right? I mean, excuse me, um, production, distribution, consumption, and exchange, right, is beginning of a positive dialectic in terms of the analysis of political economy for Della Volpe, begins the thing. So what, what he sees here is the, the movement from the Hegelian dialectic to the Marxist tradition is a continuation of a philosophical tradition that begins with Plato and Parmenides, mm -hmm. as we know, Aristotle in relation to Plato, something we attempted in a basic way today to talk about, Galileo in the relationship to the scholastics, Kant and his relation to Leibniz, where you know the implicit explicit is made more into a critique and a critique of pure reason, and then finally Marx and Hegel. So he's looking at these relationships historically, which makes him you know much more fascinating to me and also worthy of reading that he actually historicizes this. And this is all going on in this uh, in the logic as a positive science, right? And, you know, one of the reasons I'm going to reread, I'm beginning to see this in a very different light uh, uh, years later, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was a nut I mean, I underline almost every page. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, um, anyway, um, um, I think one sign of maturity is you underline less <laughs> as you go for. I read that before. I've been I going backwards. <laughs> yeah. What's that? I'm sorry. I've been going backwards then. You're going backwards? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's something to be said for that too. <laughs> um, so anyway, let me let me go on to sorry, but yeah, De Bella Volpe, um, um, you know, uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll continue with him, but the negative dialectic for him, the negative dialectical movement was in the Paris manuscripts, the critique, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts is an exemplary scientific attempt at the negative dialectics and the positive takes place 13 years later when Marx is now beginning to outline the principles for political economy based on the four categories and the totality of production consumption, distribution, and exchange, you know. Uh, which, by the way, Martin Nicholas's um, book on the Grundrisse has a very good introduction on, yeah, he's very good, Martin Nicholas. He's, he, you know, he went backwards too, Chris, he's, he's not well. No, I'm just kidding, yeah, yeah, anyway. But what a major, major you know, player to translate that book, and it's a very good introduction. And the, and the Bay Area Capital Group back in the day. All right, so um, going on to Sartre. Okay, so French existentialism. So well, the Italian schools are returning to Kant and really trying to make Marx scientific. You have two major figures that emerge in, in post-World War France, right, in terms of a, a kind of open-ended Marxism. There are other people, but Jean-Paul Sartre is obviously the father, you know, around the journal Tom Moderne, you know, 1945, Merleau-Ponty, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, formed the journal Modern Times, based on the Chaplin movie, Tom Modern, right? That's what they based it on. And they begin to put out their theses, etc. They consider themselves fellow travelers, not communists, right? Sartre wanted independence from the, you know, French Communist Party, of which Lefebvre was still a member. This other guy that you know we're going to read Henri Lefebvre. Right? So anyway, Sartre was known, as you know, after the war, as a novelist. Nausea, great piece. I reread it over Thanksgiving holiday, if we can call it that. But anyway, I reread Nausea <laughs> uh, while I'm going through the pipe bursting uh, uh, episodes <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, um, magnificent piece, uh, many studies, phenomenological studies on the imagination, perception, etc. 
transcendence of the ego, all very beautifully regional things, and an exemplary writer, a very good writer, you know, to put it mildly. The plays, the flies, the dirty hands, which is a study of the, the Communist Party. Some people have dirty hands, right? <laughs> you know, uh, the Condemned of Altona, brilliant film, a thing about Hitler, you know, and being trapped in Hitler where the famous phrase, I am my freedom, is said, hmm. you, know, um, you know, where you get the notion of condemned to be free, that freedom really implies uh, an incredible burdensome responsibility because you become totally responsible for all your actions. You cannot say the devil made me do it or the unconscious made me do it, hmm. right, in Sartrean terms. So you act as if you're acting for all of mankind and you act in good faith. No exit. And no exit, which was a great, great thing about bad faith. Hell is other people. <laughs> Hell is other people. That's right. Yes, that's right. We claw. Yeah, 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 no exit. Yeah. No way out. So you probably read a lot of this stuff in, uh, in, in, in college, right? So anyway, so he was known as a novelist, but the, the philosophical work, of course, was being in nothing. That's 1943, which was, as I've mentioned here before, was a, a, an attempt to flesh out Heidegger's lack of having the social world or the mid being mm -hmm. with others. So being in nothingness was a long exercise. I also read it as a massive attack on French psychoanalytic thinking at that time, which did not include Lacan, you know, really against the Bonapartists ruin of French psychoanalysis, Marie Bonaparte, who's most famous in my, or well, two famous things, she's a descendant of Napoleon, and also <laughs> she sold jewelry to buy Freud passage into France. She mm -hmm. was the one, she was the analyst, head of the French Psychoanalytic uh, Association. She sold her jewelry. It's a nice story, you know, I mean, you know, good for the movies, but it's an actual true story. Mm -hmm. She actually sold jewelry, and this is when Freud, when he crossed the border, when he was asked, how did you find the Gestapo? He says, I highly recommend them. <laughs> yes, right, right. <laughs> right. So, so anyway, um, but Sartre's reputation as the major, you know, French thinker, philosopher was pretty much established by the end of World War II. You know, he's the intellectual father, if you will. You know, there are many attacks on him. You begin to see, right, so great book uh, on, you know, something that, you know, should be read. Uh, uh, maybe when we do a course on the novel, we'll get a Cornelius to teach that. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, what is literature, or what is um, um, you know, uh, what is engagé literature, of which Roland Barthes and Robrier both respond. One for a new novel, the other one uh, writing degree zero. You know, which kind of opens up the field, right, to attack art. You know, in some ways. In philosophy, you know, he considers himself, post-World War II, one famous piece of his, hardly ever read, is Materialism and Revolution. I don't recommend struggling with it, but Annette Michelson, who recently passed away, who was the you know, person who put film studies on the map, film theory on the map, at NYU, uh, translated yeah, as, a, as a young, uh, young uh, woman coming up the ranks, right? She was the translator of this. Anyway, this was beginning of his time that he becomes closer and closer to communist movements and more. He was always a radical, always a rebel, and his best friend who was killed during the Spanish Civil War, Paul Nizan, was a Marxist. And also worth reading, he wrote a very good book called Philosophers and the Established Order which was a, a, an attempt to look at how philosophy as a discipline supports the ideology of the status quo mm -hmm. in some ways. Very, very interesting, Paul Nizan. Eden Arabi was another book of his. Nizan was a, a really major figure before he died, you know, beginning to be there. So Paul Nizan and Jean Cavalier are two people who died in the Spanish Civil War who were great losses, you know, great losses. Cavalier's wrote the, the Great History Theory of Logic, you know, known as the Unknown Soldier Number Five. So, um, anyway, to go, go, go back to Sartre, um, he's really a fellow traveler during this period. 
But he begins to start talking about how existentialism as a philosophy is a bourgeois philosophy. And it's about bourgeois subjectivity, you know? And he wants to retain it, but incorporate it into Marxism. But he says in this essay, as you know, that existentialism is a parasitic system that lives off of Marxism. But it is necessary, mm -hmm. right? That this notion of the subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So, so in some ways, the attack here, and let me just put up these crucial texts of his, 1946. He writes, um, existentialism is a humanism. which is basically a reply to vulgar and mechanical Marxism, right? 1946. This is a seminal essay in terms of defining what existentialism is. That they, we always proceed from existence before essence. And he goes through this very, I think very well and beautifully done. He distinguishes his brand of atheistic existentialism from the Christian existentialism of Gabriel Marcel, in particular, yeah, who was a Catholic, you know, and uh, you know, so I had a real hard time with a lot of the religious people, especially those who claimed, you know, uh, existentialism as a philosophy. They argued consistently with them, and uh, if you want to see Sartre's vicious best, read his thing on um, oh, what's the name of the guy, oh, Francois Marais. God was a bad artist, and so was Monsieur Mariac, Francis Mariac. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, Sard was really atheistic to the core. You know, it was always working, working for him. So anyway, 1946. Of course, Jean Bouffre during this period. Uh, these are stories, but relevant. Jean Bouffre told Heidegger about this piece, and and it's the distortion of design. <laughs> And Heidegger replied with letter on humanism, right? 1947. That was the pretext for letter on humanism. I'm not saying that that's what letter on humanism is about, right? So, so, so just that you know that Sard is working, you know, right, with Heidegger. Heidegger kind of works against Sard, right, in this letter on humanism. And then Sard, by 1948, is now beginning to turn left, really left, it's the turn left. Even though left turn, to use one of Stanley's books titles, uh, yeah, is turning left, right, into the fellow traveler stage, but at the same time wanting to create a kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, an independent Marxism, an independent radical and original Marxism, right, that would incorporate subjectivity was no longer about economic determinism, was no longer only about classes absolutely determinate in terms of one station, that there was still choice, there's still some freedom, right, et cetera, uh, uh, operative in the human subject. So 48 marks is turned this way. So he begins to, you know, and why he calls it the problem of method, he begins to say, how am I going to do this? He also writes in ethics, you know, because he, he never really had an ethics at the end of being in nothingness. Being in nothingness uh, ends with a sketch for something called existential psychoanalysis. You know, he's going to start working with this. This is taken up by R.D. Lang in, in England, the Tavistock Clinic. It's taken up um, um, also by people in the United States, Rollo May, uh, and uh, a few other people in the United States. And then and then comes out in a book that was very popular, I think in the 1980s, early 80s, Existential Psychotherapy by Irving Yalom. And of course, Joe Covell in Age of Desire has a whole section on Sartre and existential psychoanalysis. You know, uh, yeah. So anyway, this became one of his fields. He applied this, and you know, I think I've said this many times, that he applied this method to an analysis of Jean Genet which I think is a masterpiece, a book called saint Genet, of which Derrida re tries to rewrite with Glas, 
which was almost bankrupted. Uh, the publishing house got him on. It was so costly to, to produce. Yeah. Saint Genet, which is the title of Sartre's book, yeah. was supposed to be an introduction to, I think, Our Lady of the Flowers, and it became a book that was three times. 650 pages. How many? 650. 650 page introduction. In the French. <laughs> 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 you, know, you know what uh, John Huston said about him? You know, he wrote the Freud scenario, oh, yeah. huh? Yeah, John Huston said the man never shut up. <laughs> and, you know, he, and, he, and you can say the same about the writing. Wilfred Dassan, who I met, who, who used to visit him, you know, um, in uh, Paris, would say, Every Sartre never edited anything. He just wrote and wrote and wrote, and sometimes well, you can pick up on this. That's a lot to do with the amphetamines. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he took with him for a long time. You gotta go? Okay, sorry. Okay, we'll be in touch. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Have a good holiday, too. Yeah, bye bye. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, um, yeah, going back to this, so yeah, four psychoanalytic, existential psychoanalytic studies, Baudelaire, which is terrible, Mallarmé, not much better, and then the Flaubert study, which he would consider his masterpiece because it was a synthetic work of existential Marxism. Yeah, he, he, he worked on that to the end of his life. It's four volumes called The Idiot of the Family. It's been translated University of Chicago. Um, you know, the first 800 pages, he was going to write a little on Flaubert's childhood, 800 pages on uh, <laughs> just the childhood, so on the idiot of the family. All right, the autobiographical work, the words, of course, right, beautiful, beautiful very I honest, like very yeah. beautiful. Yeah, where was that, David? I'm sorry, were you, were you talking about Flaubert? Or yeah, Flaubert, the idiot of the family, and it's called. Well, he considered this to be his magnum opus, where he was working on until his death. You know, he kept taking amphetamines and you know, uh, Ritalin, and would meet uh, young uh, young uh, friends in the uh, in the park, uh, and uh, you know, talk about it all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a character. But, uh, ironically, ironically, uh, the guy who was the chief foreman. On the, when they were digging up in front of my place in Montreal, look like Sartre. And a friend of mine was over who does philosophy. It's Sartre out there. Yeah. So we went out and told him, you look like Jean-Paul Sartre. He had no idea what we were saying. You know? But anyway, he did an effective job, ultimately. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, going back to, yeah, I mean, the literary production the philosophical production is pretty remarkable, you know, given, you know, the conditions of existence. You know, you have to remember he was in the Stalag during the German occupation. You know, after the war, he had, you know, like everybody wanted his time and space. If you've ever seen him on YouTube, very harsh voice, j'aime ma bourgeois intellectual. <laughs> I hate the, you know, I go on how much he despises the bourgeoisie, you know, et cetera. <coughs> These were people of the world, his group. They knew all the Black Panthers. They knew Seaberg. They all hung out together. They knew a lot of jazz musicians. They knew a lot, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So this was a very much an exemplary life of the life of the writer, the scholar, the famous intellectual, the man of practice. You know, he visited... Um, um, uh, uh, Biker, Andreas Biker in jail, and he said they acted in good faith. You know, he he, he took um, you know he took very good care to support every radical movement. Uh, you know, he put the cause of the people out there. You know, uh, so you know very much into you know quote revolutionary praxis. So anyway, going back to this text, this was a, a an attempt to make. To make, um, you know, uh, existentialism relevant to the Marxist project, right? So he begins to talk about philosophy as 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 um, what, what it does, right? And the mirror of of knowledge and Marxism and existentialism, and and you know where one talks about philosophy in certain ways. I think, and I don't think I had you read this because I think it's in the uh, preface, maybe, um, 
Well, yeah. He t- in the preface, he talks about that philosophy doesn't exist, right? And the situation of it. He does speak to later in this in this section about that Lukács has the capacity to read Heidegger, but never really gave it a chance, right? So he, he does speak about that, right, uh, uh, going on. And he also goes through all the right-wing Hegelianism, right, from Kierkegaard to Karl Jaspers. Mm. And I'm not saying these are right like the way we talk about right, but they were not, I mean, when I use the word right in the European context, it means they were not leftists of the communist brand, you know, et cetera. Yeah. They were still thinkers, you know? Our right don't think. They just, you know, manipulate, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, he'll, he'll go through that, John Wall and the Ospreys. So anyway, any, any thoughts about this? And maybe we can, you know, uh, uh, close up for today. Uh, I don't want to keep you here forever. Page 21, by the way, 2021 is the Blue Cox. Let me just say this. What has existentialism preserved its autonomy? Why is it not simply dissolved into Marxism? And this is, I think, an important passage for our purposes. Right? This is page 21. Lukács believed that he answered this question in a small book called, it was actually an essay, Existentialism and Marxism. According to him, bourgeois intellectuals have been forced to abandon the method of idealism while safeguarding its results and its foundations. Hence, this historical necessity of a third way, or third path, which is between, and I'll do something on this. You know, we did some idealism today. Mm -hmm. We'll do materialism and realism when we get back. Between material, in actuality, and in the bourgeois consciousness during the imperialistic period. I shall show later the havoc with which, which this wish to conceptualize a priori has wrought at the center of Marxism. Here let us simply observe that Lukács fails absolutely to account for the principal fact we were convinced at one and the same time that historical materialism furnished the only valid interpretation of history and that existentialism remained the only concrete approach to reality. So history and reality, you can see the separation here. I do not pretend to deny the contradictions in this attitude. I simply assert that Lukács does not even suspect it. Many intellectuals, many students, have lived and still live with the tension of this double demand, the reality of their lived experience and that of history. How does this come about? It is due to a circumstance which Lukács knew perfectly well, but which he could not at that time ever mention, even mention. Marxism, after drawing us to it as the moon draws the tides, <laughs> boy, Alter, I mean, excuse me, after transforming all our ideas, after liquidating the categories of our bourgeois thought, abruptly left us stranded, shipwrecked. It did not satisfy our need to understand. In the particular situation in which we were placed, it no longer had anything new to teach us because it came to a stop, excuse me, Marxism stopped precisely because this philosophy wants to change the world because its aim is philosophy becoming the world, which is a nice phrase, right? Mm-hmm. You know, philosophy lives on because the moment for it has not yet been realized. That's Adorno. Because it is and it wants to be practical, there arose within it a veritable schism which rejected theory on one side and praxis on the other. From the moment the USSR encircled it and alone undertook its gigantic effort in industrialization, Marxism found itself unable to bear the shock of these new struggles, the practical necessities and the mistakes which are always inseparable from them. At this period of withdrawal for the USSR and of ebb tide for the revolutionary proletariats, the ideology itself was subordinated to a double need. One, security, that is unity, and its construction of socialism inside the USSR. Socialism in one country, obviously. Concrete thought must be born from praxis and must turn back upon it in order to clarify it, not by chance and without rules, but as in all sciences and techniques, in conformity with principles. Now, 
The party leaders, bent on pushing the integration of the group to the limit, feared that the free process of truth, with all the discussions and conflicts which it involves, would break the unity of combat. They reserved for themselves the right to define the line and to interpret the event. In addition, out of fear that the experience might not provide its own clarities, that it might put into question certain of their guiding ideas and might contribute to, quote, weakening the ideological struggle, end quote, they put the doctrine out of reach. The separation of theory and practice resulted in transforming the latter into an empiricism without principles, the former into a pure fixed knowledge, dogmatism in some way, right? On the other hand, with the economic planning imposed by bureaucracy unable to realize, recognize its mistake, became therefore a violence done to reality. And since the future production of a nation was determined in offices, often outside its own territory, this violence had as its counterpart an absolute idealism. You know, he's really talking about massive industrialization. He's talking here about Stalinism and how existentialism, and you know, he knows the Lukács in Moscow during this whole period, right? Yeah, yeah. So. What was the, when, when he, uh, you says, Offices outside our own territory. Was it also capitalist relations with both, capitalist both, countries? Both. Both. Yeah. Both. I mean, ironically, you know that Sartre rejected the Nobel Prize for literature. <laughs> but he did take the Lenin Prize, Peace Prize, for literature, and he gave a lecture, ironically, on Kafka and the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most of the Politburo was there. So, you know, this was a very clever <laughs> individual and very risk taking. So, anyway. Um, he goes on, I, I know you want to go, okay. Anyway, um, um, the, he, he goes on, the separation of theory and practice results in transforming the latter into empiricism without principle, the former into pure fixed knowledge. On the other hand, the economic planning imposed by bureaucracy, unwilling to recognize its own mistakes, became thereby a violence done to reality. And since the future production of a nation was determined in offices, outside its own territory. The violence had its counterpart in an absolute idealism. Men and things had to yield to ideas. And this is the show trials. It goes on Budapest, which was real in Roski's head. You know, Karl Radek, you know, a very original market. You know, Bukharin, many, many people, of course, in this. Uh, if Budapest subsoil did not allow him to construct the subway, this was because the subsoil was counter-revolutionary. This was the logic. It's very funny. Marxism is a philosophical <laughs> interpretation of man and of history necessarily had to reflect on the preconceptions of the planned economy. Fixed image of it as I live. Okay, so anyway, maybe I can leave it there. Why don't we pick up with this? I'll do something with... Uh, Coletti, I'll send out an email of what we did today. Uh, you know, we'll put it up on the thing. Um, anyway, this is an, an argument with Lukács's, you know, defense, if you will, of the Stalinist night or in social realism, as well as a way of trying to build what he would ultimately call existential Marxism. You know, and how does one do? And then you can read, to follow this up, the very interesting thing on the dogmatic versus the critical dialectic, because when people start using this vocabulary, they're going to say, you're not being dialectical enough, you can always retort. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that to be part of the di dogmatic dialectic and not really, you know, a critical dialectic. And you begin to see these levels of distinctions in the dialectic and, you know, trying to get to the real movement of history. And, you know, in Marx's case, we only know of one science, the science of history. This is uh, ultimately what, what, what's happening there. So, okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go for an early dinner if anybody wants to join down here in the neighborhood. <laughs>